Oh, there's us. That's me. That's you. <laughs> see more of those. Will I be able to see it? Yeah. Okay. Feel it. Mm -hmm. Weird. How did you know that I was going to put pictures of the river on there? All right. So, um, last few months have been busy regarding the Yampa. Um, this picture here is of the Maybell irrigation uh, flume across the Yampa River. It was built in 1911. Next slide, please. And you can see it in the background there. And then um, that that's a group that I was with some kids from the Boys and Girls Club in Moffat County crossing over the bridge of uh, the ditch that's going about to cross over that that flume there. Next, please. And so about a mile and a half up river, this is the diversion off the Yampa. And this is the um, project that the Nature Conservancy and the Maybell Irrigation District is working on um, a massive rehaul of this system here. And so upstream, the corner of the picture, you can kind of see, you know, the large boulders. You could see them better if I was a better photographer, but that probably won't ever happen. So um, there's some boater passage issues there. And then there's uh, enda endangered fish passage issues at the diversion there. So this will be reconfigured for both boater safety and for fish passage to the tune of, you know, seven to $10 million. So it's a pretty big project. A lot of folks have been involved with it. Um, our friend Luke Gingrich from JUB Engineering is doing the work, um, getting all of this ready. It's a pretty tight canyon in here too. So there's a lot of access issues that they're working out, which um, contributes to the price. Next slide, please. And so this is sort of, you can see the mile and a half. I'm standing just at the diversion taking this amazing photograph and you can you can see how you know how tight that canyon is in there and um, it was about 100 degrees down there <laughs> when we were down there which is pretty hot and um, the ditch operator walks this twice a day every day during irrigation season and before he has to walk that mile and a half uh, you have to you know go down a pretty big hill to get down to the access point, which he can drive or walk depending on conditions. And then of course, Kevin's staff um, will go and, and do their work using the same heel toe express. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. It's a really neat project. Um, it's definitely one of the biggest infrastructure projects we've tackled in the Yampa. And um, it's gonna make life in general, um, the automation, much easier for the irrigation district and um, the Yampa is an increasingly uh, popular with boaters in this stretch because it's um, unpermitted. It's before Yampa Canyon downstream of, of Craig and that's brought some tourism to Moffat County um, just in and of itself, but that boater passage is an issue. So it opens up some additional parts of the Yampa that have you know, primarily not been traveled um, all that often by boat. All right, so that's the Maybell Irrigation Ditch. Next slide, please. So I had to share with you, um, as I mentioned yesterday, Becky and Kevin joined us on the Yampa River Awareness Project trip. And so I just wanted to show you all a couple of photos here. This is um, just a few of the group of 29 getting ready to launch on the Yampa. I think it was May 20th. And you can see in the left-hand corner there, um, Daryl V. Hill from 10 Tribes Partnership, uh, Hickory Up, G Nation, and then Matt Rice with American Rivers, um, Matthew oh, McKinney. Is that McKinney? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's two, lots of Matts on this trip. Um, and he works also with the 10 Tribes Partnership, and that's me, and that's Becky. I want to point out that at this point in the trip, Becky is wearing her phone. She is still in denial that she's not going to have <laughs> internet or cell phone service for five days. And I, this, I started to worry a little bit, like maybe she's going to go mad, you know? 
And then we've got Sarah from uh, UCRC. And next slide, please. So I couldn't show you, you know, days and days worth of photos because that would take up a lot of time. But this is day, we're at day three here. And you can see that Becky has kind of become in her element. She is here at the Echo Park Confluence, which is a tradition. As part of the trip, we always stop here and talk about what the river means, um, what's going on downstream as part of the bigger Colorado River issues. And Becky here is, is giving an impassioned speech about just her work and the importance of, um, I think, you know, to me that what we talked about with you was how we all connect to rivers and the importance of a healthy system and that you know we all have to give in order to keep the system healthy the system can't die because we can't make decisions and i i think people just really fell in love with her even more than they already had over the three days here but she's really a now i'm wondering if she's going to become a river guide at this point i think it's <laughs> it's possible right next slide please Okay, so now <laughs> she's having clearly the time of her life, and she is in the kayak with uh, Kirk Johnson, who is the um, director of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, and he was just an amazing person to get to know, and, but, you know, I just love this photo when I came across it the other day. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to give you a flavor of what the canyons look like down um, in Dinosaur National Monument, taken from Harding Hole, one of our campsites, kind of up underneath a big ledge there. Um, next slide, please. And then here's the Echo Park Confluence. Um, P.S. All these photos are not taken by me. That's why you can tell what's going on and see the beauty of the natural area around you. This one was taken by a friend, Mike Feebig, and the rest are from Kent Fir Trees. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, could you go back real quick? <clears throat> so just to be clear, on the left-hand side is the Yampa, and on the right, underneath the wall, um, is the green coming in. So that's, that's where that confluence is happening. And we go downstream at what is then the Green River. Next slide, please. So this is a really neat, um, massive petroglyph um, along the green. And there's a lot of um, native, you know, just native artifacts in this canyon, but this is kind of one of our favorites. It's really, it's really big. It stands about three feet tall, four feet across at that point. Next slide, please. And here is the last night. And I just had to share. She's, <laughs> she's clearly, the transformation is coming. I don't know that she's going to come dirt. back to be <laughs> your... Um, commissioner or the director of the CWCB, but she did end up coming back. She didn't join the ORS staff, even though I think they would have had her no problem. So I think that's it, but next slide, please, just in case. Oh yeah, so back to, back to the conditions on the river. So we had a great trip. Um, the Yampa has been uh, below average all year, and this is something that probably no one can read because I can't read it either, but um, you know, I really like the work that the Climate Center does at CSU, and this is one of my favorite things to check here. And so it's the water year, um, obviously starting in October last year, and you can see actual and what's what's normal for precipitation and what percentage you're at. And so you can see that we had that jump in <clears throat> um, December, and then really not until May um, we kind of ended up with that miracle May, which really carried us through it uh, sustained flows through town as as you all know we don't really we're not able to operate our system um, like many of you do through dam release um, at a constant throughout the year so the natural flow and and what we receive through nature is is pretty much what we get there and so we actually because of some of the low temperatures and rain that we received in may and, and even just a little bit in june but as you can see not too much um, we were able to have um, a longer season of uh, cold temperatures in the river and, um, and, and better flows than, than we have over the last few years. Um, and so, you know, just yesterday they 
closed the, the Yampa for fishing and last Friday closed it to tubing. So um, we're already in our closures and, and both of those were temperature related, not flow related, although the flows are, are certainly dropping with the, the warm weather we've been getting. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share is that I hope that we'll see uh, the city of Steamboat come through with a grant um, <clears throat> for Yampa River access in the city of Steamboat Springs. Uh, people are, which is great, increasingly recreating um, in the spring runoff months in the Yampa. And you know, typically before the last, I'd say five or six years, um, especially before the advent of the paddleboard, there were very few people that would get out on their boats besides kayakers in the spring runoff. And now we see just a ton more action and, and definitely a, so much more fishing on the Yampa than you know me growing up there than I ever have in my life. And so just a lot more boater traffic. Um, but we don't actually have uh, really any great put-ins and takeouts um, in, in and around Steamboat Springs. And that's, you know, causing um, some safety issues. It's, it's causing access issues. It's causing crowding. Uh, so hopefully um, throughout their work of, of looking at different grants and, and the like, they'll be able to um, come before uh, the round table or this board and, and share their um, issues in more detail. And, and maybe we'll be able to work on a project with them in the future. So um really that's my report thanks for listening really appreciate all of you and that's it so we'll move on to uh paul Bruchet, colorado river main stem thank you madam chair um good morning directors and staff and all so um in the spirit of the the may meeting um i want to roll on with my message of hope here um it's not all great but i'd like to try at least no problem. No problem. Um, so you might recall in May, I had a little video of a planting that we had done with my kids running around out there. Um, <clears throat> this is my son. He's taken over for Dr. Perry Cabot and all the, the study work that we're doing. Um, he's pretty effective and efficient with the work that he does. Um, next slide. So that, that video that I showed in May of the, the early planting growth, um, this is what it looks like as of two days ago. Um, that is a pile of sand foin that is growing interseeded um, in, a, in a meadow that's pretty dominant with grass. And that's something that the interseed is pretty challenging to do and something that we're working on. Um, that sand foin um, being studied by the Land Institute at 6,500 feet um, is using 17 to 18 inches of water, natural plus irrigation, uh, to grow a little bit over three tons of, of forage. Whereas uh, the study site for the Upper Colorado River water conservation project um, our averages are about 24 to 26 inches of water use um, to produce about two tons of hay that is not as rich in nutrition as what this sand point is and so the the message of hope what's pretty neat um, the water conservation project that you know we kicked off um, thanks to this board and the round table back in 2020 there's a lot of moving parts looking at different forage types um, how we can operate long-term save water um, and make our places better because that's pretty fascinating when you can grow more with less and actually be better off. Um, so we're quite excited about this project and, and more to come in September, maybe a little bit more at the end of this director's report. On the downside of things from the message of hope though, I wanted to give you all a little dose of what it's like to live in Grand County. Um, next slide, please. So this was uh, yesterday at, at 321 and I didn't know how to make it larger so that you would all be able to see it, but it's a flash flood warning from the National Weather Service um, at 321 yesterday, um, specifically targeting uh, the Williams Fork burn scar. So um, as you read down, some of you who live near burn scar areas are probably used to getting these um, notices. Um, but it very clearly says uh, some locations that will experience flash flooding include areas in, the, in and near the Williams Fork burn area. Precautionary preparedness actions, move to high ground now, act quickly to protect your life. And so we run a ditch on the Williams Fork River and we've been playing this game um, for going on the last two years now where you make a decision about how proactive do we try and be when these warnings and alerts come to manipulate the ditch versus let it go. And then see, fortunately, this did not end up being a, a bad event yesterday and we're grateful for you know the warnings, but 
<clears throat> this is on top of what happened yesterday then um, at the learning by doing operations meeting. Next slide, please. So we have our flash flood warnings. This is a uh, ranch Creek uh, tributary of the Fraser river. And you can see on the right as the blue line gets above the red, um, that's a chronic exceedance uh, for the last several days. Next slide, temperature exceedance. So this next one um, is the acute temperature. So this is the Colorado river at Windy Gap, um, hot sulfur springs, and then Williams fork. And you can see those lines on the acute, um, that red line is 76 degrees. So this is main stem Colorado River, um, cold water fishery. Um, clearly you can see over the last 10 days, uh, we've been in a world of hurt up there. Uh, warmer temperatures than normal as you know, pretty much across the state. Um, <clears throat> I'm surprised frankly, with some of the afternoon showers and thunderstorms we've had that we haven't had a, a greater break in this. Um, Cause I would sure think so being on the ground. Um, but I think that, you know, the good news is that learning by doing wild and scenic, there's a lot of great, intelligent, caring people that are working on this issue. Um, but somewhere between um, the additional silt and sediment from the burn scars um, combined with low flushing flows for a season, you know, super warm temperatures. Um, this is our, our Colorado River. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the, the same three, but this is tracking the chronic as all three of those lines uh, get near the red at the top in the right corner. Next slide, please. And this is uh, Colorado River at Catamount. Um, chronic exceedance there on the right. You can see dating back to J July 5th, July 6th um, for a long period of time. So you can see the impacts of this. And, you know, getting back to the message of hope, I, I had the opportunity to talk with Mr. Sturm a little bit yesterday about this. You know, within this stretch, you know, we're working, Learning by Doing has several projects that continue to go on. We've got the Colorado River Connectivity Channel. Um, we've got the Habitat Restoration Project um, led by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. We've got ILVK project down in the area around Kremling. We've got the Wild and Scenic Group. And so I still have hope about this, but I think that, you know, right now is the time to put the pedal to the metal on getting some work done. Um, because, you know, if, if we go through years like this, you can imagine the impacts that this is having, uh, not only to recreation, fishing guides, uh, fishermen, but also just to, to agriculture. I had a, a neighbor that operates a fixed station pump that about three or four days ago just gave up because of so much uh, biological mass coming in the head gate. He couldn't fight it any longer to try and irrigate. So we have our challenges, but uh, we have hope and partnership that things continue. Next slide, please. And uh, my daughter, the dirt scientist, now is spreading to her friends, continue to work on plantings for soil health that I'm pretty excited about. Um, I spoke with the River District and they wanted me to share all of this with you. Um, in early June, the River District launched an accelerator grant opportunity as part of their efforts to support water users in accessing bipartisan infrastructure law funding. The accelerator grants are intended to develop competitive federal funding applications and are designed to support grant writing, feasibility, design, preliminary environmental review, benefits analysis, and engineering with the final deliverable of a federal funding application. Um, we've had strong interest from our water users and have had pre-application meetings with over 20 projects. As a part of that process, the River District is trying to make an early effort to anticipate uh, matching needs for projects beyond the 50 to 75% that might be covered by federal funding for implementation. The intent is for the River District to engage the CWCB and other state and local partners to identify ways to support future matching needs for projects that are successful in receiving federal funding awards. The River District's hope is that the accelerator grants are complementary to CWCB's efforts to implement the 5 million made available through HB 22-1379, um, agenda item 13. So you can tell I did not write that, um, Amy Moyer did, um, but I think the River District is up to some pretty neat stuff and continues to want to leverage all of that with CWCB and continued work. And then the other brief update that I, I still can't get um, my arms around and figure this out. Um, I talked to Grand Valley before I came in there in the same boat where We've had this heat wave, but we've had enough uh, natural precipitation coming down that it's really helped the forage, not necessarily enough to help anything with water temperatures. Um, their demands down there are still high. They're mostly in wheat harvest mode, which has relieved you know, some of the pressure on it, but the river remains hot. And without some of this monsoonal flow, um, I think we can only imagine what kind of a devastating year uh, this would otherwise be. It's tough as it is, um, but without those rains, it could be even worse. And then that's the same thing for us. I frankly do not recall ever in late July seeing the, the Grand County Middle Park area as green as it is. Um, sagebrush, you know, um, it's, it's green. We've just had enough of that natural precipitation, but it's not enough to really make the impact um, to the watersheds. It's more of a forage-based rain, you know, that's helping, but same story without that 
I can't imagine where we're at. So with that, um, more to come, like I said about in September, um, we've been working uh, the partnership for the water conservation project, um, remaining with the same partners. And we have overlapped now on, we had a research meeting two days ago um, with the Land Institute. They're based out of Kansas and um, it's pretty neat. If you wanna look them up, it's landinstitute.org. And they've focused their plant types for different purposes, really, other than water scarcity. Um, but I think over the last couple of years and the things that we're working on, we realized some of the overlap here, um, being in a water scarce location um, and what kind of water it takes to actually grow plants. So we are hoping to further that partnership and launch it. And I think um, good things to come as far as agriculture and growing food in the Colorado River Basin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Director Bruchet. That was great. Any questions for Director Bruchet? Okay, moving right along. Uh, Director Hawkins, San Juan, San Miguel, Dolores River Basin. Thank you. I um, need to up my game with slide decks next time we, <laughs> we meet. I don't have one for today. Um, I would say the, the themes that I'm seeing in my basin continue to be forest health, managing through scarcity and a lot of collaborative work, particularly in the stream management planning and integrated watershed management planning space. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a few things in the basin that might give context for what's happening. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about the Upper San Juan Watershed Enhancement Partnership. This has been an active IWMP work. And so we're now seeing that group getting um, per, you know, funding to take their stakeholder group into a permanent watershed group. And we're also seeing the group starting to pull down really significant pieces of funding. So they were one of two environmental water resources projects that was funded in this funding cycle by the Bureau of Reclamation. The other project is in Director Brown's basin, the Maybell project. Um, so I think we're starting to see the fruit of all this labor, which is stakeholder groups that are really working well together that are now being able to take projects that have been vetted through these processes and actually pull down state and federal dollars. So it's my hope that that's sort of the future coming out of these processes in the basin. Um, they're incredibly resource and time intensive to go through. They require a huge commitment from stakeholders. And so it was a bright spot when I saw the funding announcement that a, a really significant project on the upper San Juan is going to be moving forward. Um, and it's not the only project that's moving forward out of that process. Um, we concluded our stakeholder process on the San Miguel River, which I'm really proud of as I was the co-lead in my role for the Nature Conservancy. That was a multi-year effort and just had I was reflecting yesterday with someone that we had county commissioners from both San Miguel and Montrose County at I think every meeting that we had, sometimes multiple commissioners as well as really strong leadership from the ag community, from environmental, rec, municipal, you name it, they were there. We on average had between 20 and 30 stakeholders in those meetings. So that process is complete. The project list is approved and the San Miguel water Shed Coalition, which is the local water group, is going to be stepping up to take leadership of moving that plan forward. Um, there's active other active planning processes on the Mancos and Animus River that I'm really excited about moving forward as well. Um, from our basin roundtable, we're meeting next week. We've been doing a lot of work. We're doing some bylaw adjustments around our recorder as we're seeing some change there. Um, we've been having meetings about how we're going to handle funding. And I know I flagged this yesterday, but the sort of rapid movement of we're going to have a lot of money. We're not going to have money sort of makes governance at the, at the round table a little tricky. And so we have been meeting and talking about that and sort of given the decision that was made yesterday and the upcoming changes in WSRF, I assume we will be talking more next week. Um, as far as, you know, weather, we have seen some good monsoonal activity. We just had an incredibly dry spring until June. It just 
I sort of was scared to step outside sometimes, <laughs> like afraid of throwing a spark. Um, in mid-June, we started to see some pre-monsoonal activity coming in. And I had the good fortune that we had a six-day um, partnership river trip on the San Juan River with tribal, state, federal, and conservation partners. And uh, we were a little worried about the flows being sufficient to get through the river. And it rained so hard that we were bathed in mud, just riding a rain bubble for six days down the river. I'll bring some pictures next time. Um, and so we've been seeing, you know, continued monsoonal activity. I'm not sure that it's enough to really help with water stress in the area, but I'm sure, you know, it's, it's doing, do it, doing some good, particularly on forest health. On the Dolores River, um, there has been work on a national conservation area bill for as long as I've worked on the river and many years before. We're talking sort of decades of work here. That bill was recently introduced. Um, so I'm sure there will be much discussion moving forward. I tend to see it as more of a public lands bill in the river corridor than affecting water management. That might be a perspective that isn't shared by everybody in my basin. Um, so I do anticipate that there will be a lot of discussion moving forward. Um, clearly that's one of the most water stress tributaries um, in my basin where there are tremendous challenges right now. And I wanted to end by reflecting a little bit on conversations that we had yesterday about the time that we're in and sort of how this board can lead. And so I was thinking about when Kelsey McElroy came and presented her work to us and talked about how the scaffolding that needs to be built, but also that there's this trend of really not doing the hard work until crisis is imminent. And so I wanted to say today that I think we're there as a state. It's time for us to start designing and testing the solutions that'll work in our basins. It's not too soon to do this. How we deal with water stress, whether it's inherently local or Colorado River, um, we need to find the things that are gonna work in our basins. And so at the confluence of a lot of money being available and coming through this board and federal resources and the kinds of challenges that we're navigating, I think that now is the time to lean in and to design solutions that work for us in Colorado. And so that is my hope as we bring more WSRF funding, as we have resources available to get federal funding into our basins. If you've been thinking about a project, if you've been thinking about talking to your neighbor or a local conservation group about an idea, this is a good time to do it. And I'll conclude my report there. Thank you, Director Hawkins. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> Director Anderson with the Gunnison. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I usually start my talk with a slide of the uh, drought map of Colorado. I don't have that today. In fact, I don't have any slides, but uh, you know, with the, and we're enjoying the monsoonal flow in, in the Gunnison Basin, but it, so far, it has uh, very little impact on the drought conditions, and uh, that's somewhat interesting because, uh, as Paul was referring to the to the uh, grass in the in his area, we my travels around the uh, Gunnison Basin. My goodness, the feed is just wonderful and. Uh, you know, it's it's at least had uh, the monsoonal flow has at least had an effect on that. It's been an interesting week for me. Uh, last Wednesday, I attended a, a water education Colorado uh, event in Gunnison, uh, water fluency, and Stacy Bond and Jayla Pobleton were there and uh, spoke. I spoke to the group. Uh, there were about uh, 35 attendees, and it was really refreshing to see uh, the 
interests there and, and, and those people taking their time to become involved in the water business. And, and I certainly encourage them and encourage them to take part in their, in their round tables. Uh, one thing I see in the Gunnison Basin round table is uh, the, the players are the same players for years and years and, and new blood would really be refreshing. And, and, and quite frankly, they all look a little bit, bit like myself. They're getting a little long in the tooth and, <laughs> and it, it's not gonna last forever, certainly. The, the next day, Thursday, I attended a, a land and water committee and this is a, a group on the Uncompagra, uh, Mike Berry, uh, which, uh, Tri-County Water has headed this group up for some time. And, and they have a, a group of uh, planners and county officials from uh, the array, uh, Montrose and Delta County. It's the uh, Uncompagra, so we're not, not involved with other areas of the Gunnison Basin. And, and they've really done an interesting job of, of getting that communication between uh, the water providers and uh, the developers and, and the planners and so forth. Anyway, uh, they have come up with a, a film uh, and you can see this on westslopewaterinfo.com. I, I was not gonna bore you with playing it here, but if you're interested, you can go to uh, westslopewaterinfo.com and see uh, Rethinking Water, our precious resource. And, they really did a great job with this. So they got some pictures of, of history and pictures of what Montrose looked like before the Gunnison Tunnel. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to me. Uh, then this past Monday, we had a, a Gunnison Basin Roundtable meeting. Uh, we didn't have any uh, WSR grants there. Uh, we did uh, approve uh, a letter of support for uh, Taylor Dam hydroelectric power plant. Uh, this is uh, something dear to me. I've, I've worked on this for, for some time and uh, they have, uh, in order to build this, you have to have a lease power privilege with the Bureau of Rec and they've all but got that. They've got some NEPA studies to finish up to get that in place. Uh, and what their letter of support was for was a water smart grant from the Bureau of Reclamation to help with construction costs. Uh, I feel certain that they will come to this board for uh, looking for a loan to, to build the plant, but that's uh, out sometime. It's interesting that the, our initial feasibility studies had the project costing uh, somewhere around a million bucks for 500 kW plant that would just service the area around Taylor Park and, and up above to Pitkin in those areas. Uh, it's different than the power plants that the water users have on their conduits, on their canals, and this is on a dam. So you have to go through uh, Bureau of Rec uh, uh, engineering, which uh, essentially tripled the cost of the project. So, uh, and for what, I don't know, but I understand the safety concerns with messing with the Bureau of Rec down. Um, the, the other things that, that we uh, uh, talked about at the meeting was, uh, uh, Chris Sturm was there and talked about his wildfire ready watersheds. Uh, and thanks, Chris, a very great job and very interesting. I think we hear from Chris at, at this meeting later on. Um, um, uh, Russ Sands was there and we discussed where we are with the Colorado water plan. And we did spend uh, quite a bit of time on the Colorado issues. Uh, you have to forgive me, but I think it's time that I I ran a little bit. Uh, this this becomes very personal. You're dealing with my livelihood, with my neighbor's livelihood. That water is very valuable to us. I watched what the lower basin has done, and I'll exclude Nevada. I think they've done a good job of conserving water. 
California with the big straw in the river taking more than the whole state of Colorado does from it in 4 million acre feet. Arizona, and we know what kind of characters they are when it become evident they were playing the game a few years ago and, and uh, using their timing of the releases from Mead so that we'd have to release more water from Lake Powell. And then to take that water out in the desert and recharge aquifers that they have no method of reclaiming it. Now the lower basin, they have multiple crops down there. I was in the Phoenix area last winter and they were cutting hay in March. And that wasn't the first cutting of the, of the year. They cut eight to 10 cuttings a year down there. In the California, they're raising three different crops. We have just started to see with the, with the warmer climate that we're seeing in Colorado, some double crop in the mine at neck of the woods. My point, the final point is, is that in my memory of life on my, our family farm, there hasn't been a year where we had all the water that we would want. And I'll just leave it at, at that. But uh, I appreciate what Celine says that it is time for some action. Thank you. Thanks, Director Anderson. Well said. We will move to, unless there's questions, questions for Steve. We'll go ahead and move to the uh, North Platte River Basin Director's Report. Good morning, Director Trick. Thank you, good morning. Hope you can all hear me okay. And I do have hopefully maybe one photo. I, I got it a little late over to Viv Vivian, so if it doesn't show up, that's okay. Um, but just to start out, I would just um, like to offer my condolences to Director Sakata, since I haven't been able to see you or, or speak to you since, since your loss. Um, you're in my thoughts and, and I'm thinking of your family at this time. And I think the photo may be up, yeah, hopefully soon. Um, that photo hopefully that you will see is debris flow from part of the Mullen fire burn scar. And that photo is provided by the US Forest Service to our round table members. Um, and this fire was in 2020, uh, around October of 2020. And ju they just took this photo um, of the, the denudation of a significant section of the watershed along the North Platte River. And this fire, if you remember, was at the sort of the northern part of the county and went into the southern part of Wyoming. So this, this is a photo of um, the reach, you know, of the northern part of Colorado around the North Platte and the southern section in, in Wyoming. So um, as we've been talking about burn scars and flooding risks and fire, <laughs> impacts. Um, that's one of the ones that we're seeing now from a fire in 2020. And that's my only slide. So you can go ahead and remove that whenever you're done, Vivian. Thank you. And in other news, we've just been fortunate here this year to have had a, a decent, maybe even quote unquote normal um, water year. And irrigation season is now winding down. We've personally shut off our irrigation water here and we're preparing for haying season now, along with most of the other producers in the basin that are likely doing the same. And it looks like it'll hopefully be a normal hay crop this year, which will be great. Um, and like I said, we, we've been more fortunate than other areas of the state that we've, we've had a pretty decent uh, irrigation season this season. So hopefully, Hopefully that continues on into the next years to come. Um, another news, the stakeholders up here in Division 6 have been working with State Engineer Ryan on the measurement rules. So we're awaiting the most recent updates on that, but um, we appreciate him reaching out and, and working with our stakeholders on that issue. In roundtable news, the last meeting took place in 
April. And so we haven't had another meeting since our last CWCB board meeting. But as you saw on the consent agenda, we did have approval of a WSRF project for a reservoir enlargement on that consent agenda at this meeting. So, and the next meeting of the round table here will be held on September 27th. And finally, I'm just gonna keep it short this time, but um, coming up on a positive note, coming up this weekend and starting tomorrow, we have our North Park days up here. We're gonna have um, some events, activities, including live music vendors and a car show. So if you are in the area, feel free to stop by and see us and join in. And with that, I will end my report. Thank you. Thanks, Director Trick. It's nice to see you and thanks for the photo. That's it's a little rough there. Um, Director Sakata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Thank you. Um, first off, um, I think Viola sent it out by email to the board members. I just have kind of a list of meetings of interest that you might and then links, links to them. What? There's always meetings, right? Exactly. <laughs> But really to take note that I really like to highlight what's going on on the research farms across the state. So really take a look for those if there's any in your area, whether it's Arkansas Valley, West Slope, there's USDA has a research center up in Greeley, I'll be going to that one. And then also we have an um, uh, interesting international meeting going on in Denver uh, from the Soil and Water Conservation Society. I'm not a member of that society, but I looked at their agenda and I actually signed up to attend that one. So. You can take a look at that. I provided links to give you some information on there. So next slide, please. I was really excited to have you guys here in Denver and I was gonna invite some of you to actually stay at our house, um, thinking that would be fun to be able to ride to the meeting with you. But as I was talking to Director Ryan earlier, our house, we don't have air conditioning. And as a good farmer, I have a projection clock that has the temperature, time and temperature on it. You can see the picture on the left was 87 degrees in my bedroom at 9.50 in the evening. And then by midnight, it went down to 83 degrees. So. That's why uh, I was not a good host and did not invite any of you to my house this time, but maybe next time. Uh, next slide, please. But that's really just to demonstrate the heat, of course, that everybody's been talking about. Um, this is weather data from one of the Coagmet stations. Uh, our, our farm, we were one of the first to participate. I think we were one of the first 10 Coagmet stations that went up. We actually purchased the station and put it on one of our farms as part of an onion research project. And so the graph on the left, you'll see the blue line is actually precipitation up to for this year. Um, you can see we flatlined uh, the end of May. We haven't had any measurable precipitation. So we're actually unfortunately approaching the uh, worst year on record, which was I think 2012, the red line. And on the right is um, evaporative demand. Again, that's been increasing, of course, with the temperatures and the wind that we've been having. So next slide, please. Um, as Director Mitchell had mentioned and other people have mentioned, it's really a sad day that we had a loss of life due to the flash flooding that occurred west of Lubbock. This was just a screenshot of some of the news information that was going on. And uh, I also saw on the news that they were talking about those beaches, beach in a bag, I think is what they called them, that actually looked like that protected some of the housing up there. So that was really interesting to hear the background on, on that. So next slide. So really appreciate all the work the CWCB is doing, Chris Sturm and the group on, on working to protect our watersheds and also mitigation after fires. Um, real quickly, I've showed this picture. This is not a recent picture. This is a file picture of our diversion structure off of the South Platte for the, for the uh, Fulton Irrigation Ditch. We took out a loan out from CWCB of about a million dollars to put in this screening device, which is not working worth a darn. Uh, it was interesting, Director Boucher, what you said, the biological material is just creating habit for us. It, the, it's just not working. Next slide, please. So what you'll see is, is this up and down. We have to have somebody there throughout the day to manually be clearing off the, the, the uh, alodia and pond weed that's coming down, floating down the river. And then at night, when it's really too unsafe to have somebody there, you can see that uh, our flows into our irrigation ditch drop off. So it's a challenge that we're looking to figure out how we can solve this issue. Next slide. Um, I reached out to Deb Daniels on the Republican River. Um, as we heard about the efforts on, uh, as a result of the Groundwater Compact Compliance Fund, they're so appreciative of those funds uh, as they work toward on the South Fork Zone, where, you know, in order, they built that pipeline in order to provide augmentation water in order for that full amount to account toward 
the compact, they need to dry up 10,000 acres by the year 2024. So that's a big, big lift for them, but they're working hard to do that. And that's not, that's just the first step because then after that, by 2029, they have to retire 25,000 acres. Uh, and they're also working on stream restoration of the Republican River, especially where Bonnie, Bonnie Reservoir was dried up through there. So there's a lot of work going on in that area. Next slide, please. Um, South Platte Roundtable. This is actually a picture of, I believe his name was Matt Major, who took the pictures for the first um, water plan. And uh, he was probably out to some of your guys' places to take the pictures again for the water plan. So I took a picture of him taking a picture. And I thought it'd be <laughs> kind of fun to maybe in the next, you don't have to do it for this water plan, Russ, but maybe for the next one, you could follow Matt's footsteps and take pictures of where he took pictures before. <laughs> to see some differences. Uh, but it was funny, you can see he has tennis shoes on. I was his first stop and he didn't have irrigation boots on it, but I made him go ahead and go out in the field and he got muddy and he appreciated it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but the South Platte round table, we had a meeting last week. Um, I, there was about 25 people that attended in person. I, don't, I wasn't able to sign on, so I couldn't tell you how many people were attending virtually. Um, but I'll again, really request staff that um, I think to encourage, we, through COVID, we really learned that there's a lot of possibilities going virtual, but I'm concerned that we're losing participation as we go forward with this hybrid type approach that as I've over the past week, uh, tried to participate in other basin roundtables, it has been really challenging to hear people and to see people. And I think you're going to lose participation that way. And if, we're, if we want people to be there and to and to develop projects and to work with us, I think we really need to make it as easy as possible for them to participate. Uh, you know, I think the Yampa Green actually, I think was one of the best. They had one of those meeting owls there and it was pretty cool that we could actually see the whole, who was talking. Uh, Russ was probably the hardest person to hear. I don't know why Russ, you were right up front and you were right there, but um, you know, I, I would hope that we would really help the round tables with the technology in this effort. Uh, next slide, please. And, and Russ, I had asked that you put more vegetable pictures in the plan and you did, so thank you very much. Uh, so I figured I better put some in my report. Um, on the west slope of Colorado, they just started sweet corn harvest. This is actually a picture of that. Uh, it's an operation called detasseling, where they cut the tassels off the top uh, with the picture on the left. And then it results is on the right-hand side. And that makes it a lot easier for individuals to go out into the field and, and actually pick the corn. So. Next slide. So we're excited to have, and be sure everybody to look for Colorado fruit and vegetables now. And if you click it one more time, because this is a drone video, Director Boucher. Um, so this is an operation of corn cultivation. And this took place on uh, July 1st. This was one of our last corn fields and it's kind of jumpy, but I, um, uh, this field is a center pivot irrigation. Uh, we're just cultivating it to clear out the weeds, of course, uh, and then applying liquid fertilizer on both sides of it. You can just click it again and let's go to the next slide. And the next slide is all, and click it again, because this is a video. This is a parcel of land that's close to Brighton. As it, it'll, everything that you see that's dark green is our irrigated property. All around it is stuff that have been dried out. And of course you see the houses in the background, which really is making it difficult to farm in this area. Right across the bottom of the screen there, you're gonna, it's a little bit hard to see. You'll see some bare areas. That's actually prairie dogs that are encroaching on our bean field and just literally eating up the bean field right now. And again, that's happening because nobody's farming around us anymore. And so that property is either going to weeds or becoming infested with, with uh, prairie dogs and then moving on to our facility because there's no other vegetation for them to have. South Platte River is in the background, again, with all the gravel pits that have been developed into water storage. So next slide, please. And click it again, just to be artsy. Again, I love my drone. <laughs> this is looking down at a, a corn plant. You can see it's just started the tassel. This was two days ago, uh, flying straight up. This is furrow irrigated. It's really cool. You could actually see what rows the water actually didn't go down through. Uh, eventually you're gonna see a white pipe through there. That's a gated pipe. These rows are so long that in order to make the runs that the water has to flow down through, we set a gated pipe right in the middle of the field in order to be more, a little bit more efficient on the flows. Again, beautiful background. You can see why people want to live here, of course. You get the mountains in the background, but it is really making it harder to, to farm. Next slide, please. And finally, again, 
Director Trick and everybody, everybody online, thank you for all of you that have uh, sent your condolences and your thoughts and prayers to me and my family and with the passing of my father. Um, he lived a, an amazing life, 96 years. And, uh, the picture on the left uh, upper corner of this, I don't know if many of you know this, but here in this building on the third floor, they have an exhibit called 100 Items, 100 Objects of Colorado. And one of those objects is actually my dad's hat. Uh, it may not be there yet because they were actually nice enough to send it back to us so that we could have it during his celebration of life service. And so I actually brought it back here yesterday and I'm not too sure yet if it's back on display yet or not. But I think, you know, what he, and he, he was alive at that time when this display went up. And I think the main reason that he agreed to have it put on display is because the hat wasn't representing him. It was representing all the farm families across Colorado and agriculture, you know, that have worked so hard and really are the foundation for the economy in general. I mean, without food and fiber, what are we all going to do? And I think that's where he was so proud to have that there. But really, it is amazing. Next slide, please. That is actually, again, it's part of the celebration of life. Uh, what we did is a, one of our onion storage buildings, which um, uh, director that you'll recognize these are similar to potato sheds that uh, what we did is some of the recognition the plaques and and uh, things that he had earned over the year we actually nailed them up on the wall this is so this is a, about 175 foot long and we put them across there just so people could reminisce about everything that he accomplished but it again as i look at it and i as i think it you know as i've gone to other celebration of life services recently from friends of my dad's I hope that we can all take inspiration from that. And I ho hope that more young people would actually go to this, some of these events to see what is possible and to see what people are able to accomplish when they put their minds through it. It's really amazing. Everybody has a favorite Bob story. And one of mine is, is as many of you may know, is when I graduated high school, the last thing I wanted to be was a farmer because I saw how hard my parents worked. As my mom jokes, and I shared this story with many of you, that she said they were married for 66 years but because they work together, she considers it 132 years, <laughs> which I think is so true. You know, it's amazing to be able to work with somebody uh, and, and, and live with them too, to go home with them at night. Um, but the insight that my father had, one of the things I, I think he knew my hesitation of going back to the farm. And he says, Robert, even though with everything that he had been through, that, you know, losing everything when he was moved to the internment camp into Utah, uh, coming to Colorado, luckily enough to find somebody that was willing to to uh, uh, buy his first piece of ground for him and then working hard throughout his life to build it up to where it has been today. Even though he went through all of that, he was observant enough. And I think this, he did this with everybody that he, he pulled me aside one day. He said, Robert, he said, I had it easy and you're going to have it hard because I was at the bottom. I had nowhere else to go, but up and you're up here and it's going to be harder to stay up here. So it's amazing to me that the insight that he has, and I hope that we can all learn from people like him because they surround us all. Uh, I, like I said earlier, I think um, our most precious resource we have is the people that are around us. And I'm so thankful to be here with all of you today. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, fellow board members. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Director Sakata. And thanks for sharing um, those last few slides to give us a flavor of how you celebrated him. It's really neat. Um, all right. Any questions for Director Sakata? Well, that would bring us to Director Felt on the Arkansas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a slideshow or anything today. Um, and I've been pretty busy, so I don't have a whole lot uh, even organized in my mind. But I was thinking back to our last meeting in May, and uh, I drove up from Salida went the longer way over Fremont Pass so I could look at the snowpack myself back May 17th, I think it was, uh, and was really disturbed by what I saw. And then I came home over Hoosier Pass through South Park and you know it just only reinforced the situation. And then on the Thursday, I had uh, the Southeastern board meeting and we were looking at you know, the, the data that we typically do that time of year in terms of the projections for um, imports on the Fryark project and looking at uh, 
snow water equivalents and projections and things in the Arkansas. And it was just really dismal. And um, I was slated to go to uh, California to help my parents open up their little cabin for the summer. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was May uh, 19th or something that Friday. And I, I was, as chairman of the board of commissioners, I was afraid to leave my county. I felt like the place was going to just combust. Uh, it just had that feeling, you know, you could just throw a match and whoosh. And I realized that um, during my whole time on the CWCB, uh, as everybody is probably sick of hearing about, you know, I had to manage the COVID situation in our county. And that has sort of occluded my memory of also having to deal with the Decker fire back in 2019 and just, you know, this really threatening situation that happened. Uh, and anyway, it's sort of all coming back in this traumatic, you know, psychological way there. And then that Friday night, it started to snow. And, you know, Salida doesn't get a lot of, really a lot of snow in town. Um, but we had after, you know, you'd saturated the ground and, and, and um, things got colder and finally and the snow quit melting for a while. I mean, we ended up with a true foot of snow on the ground in Salida um by the time it stopped and it was just many of our basins got to experience like that i don't think the rio grande did i don't know i don't think the southwest corner probably did either but it really just we were in fire restrictions in mid-may you know it's just really really weird and uh and we haven't gone back into fire restrictions since um we've also had this tremendous monsoon flow I've talked about our voluntary flow management program on the Arkansas, it's just really phenomenal program. And, you know, the way that works is from July 1st to August 15th, um, fully consumable Trans Mountain Water is uh, released from Twin Lakes to try and maintain a base flow of 700 CFS uh, down in Wellsville, basically down in Salida. And we were having meetings in June, despite that snowstorm, uh, talking about, well, what what are we gonna do if it drops below 700 before July 1st? Um, that's not part of the program. We were coordinating with Alan Ward at Pueblo Board of Waterworks, who is just a heroic, uh, a heroic figure in our basin in terms of helping us achieve non-consumptive beneficial use. And he, uh, you know, he had water to move to. So we were, we were kind of working out some side deals to, to try to keep the, the river economy going, so to speak. And then these rains came and uh, in the end, we didn't even have to start augmenting till July 12th. So we went from um, thinking we'd have to start early, thinking we might not make it through the whole time, thinking we'd have to set a lower sort of compromise target to actually we haven't burned that much water yet. And um, you know, we only have whatever it would be about 35 days to go or something like that. So that, that whole thing's just working out um, really well. And it's amazing to me how greened up things are, not just in my basin. I was over in the Rio Grande Basin uh, last weekend and gosh, the Sangres and places look like Kauai or something uh, compared to the way they were looking back in May. So, so really phenomenal, but it was interesting listening to Celine and her sort of call to action and thinking, you know, I was, um, Two months ago, I was scared to leave my county and I felt like everything was going to explode and it was sort of paralyzing. And then uh, now we're feeling kind of green and fat and it's sort of paralyzing in a different way. And uh, she's absolutely right. Um, we can't continue to sort of just bounce around with these emotional, anecdotal, momentary states of mind, but really do need to just embrace the long term trajectory that we all see and um, and get to work on those solutions. So I thought that was really well said. Um, one other thing about our basin specifically that is uh, interesting to me, we're, we're actually already at the 60th uh, anniversary of John Kennedy signing the Fry Arc authorizing legislation. So it's a, gone by quickly basically my, my lifetime, a little more than my lifetime. But, um, and we are continuing to make really good progress on the Arkansas Valley Conduit, which will bring really good quality water from Pueblo Reservoir to those 
I think it's about 24 different lower basin communities um, that suffer from radionuclides and selenium. Um, all naturally occurring, but uh, still, that that's really great consolation. You know, it's <laughs> we're stuck with it forever. Um, so anyway, they they are uh, we're really making progress, and we're getting some great federal allocations um, that will help match the great contribution uh, or commitment that the board it was here before my time, but some of you, many of you, are still here that you guys made. Uh, to support the conduit, it's just huge. It's really been motivational and helps everyone, I think, see that it can be done and it will be done. So I uh, really appreciate that. And then just a few, I just wanna call out a few folks on, on the staff that I've been um, interacting with. I, on um, June 1st or 2nd, we, we had the Colorado County's um, summer conference up in Vail and, um, as we did at the winter conference with Becky, we had another water uh, sort of informational or educational water panel discussion. And um, Russ came and gave a sneak preview kind of of the water plan. Um, it was literally at the same time that we had that evening meeting um, that was kind of painful uh, to me just because I was at this conference and doing that too. But um, so we were, you know, continuing to improve on the plan in some ways, but Russ was uh, very nimble and um, we had a great uh, group of folks there, including um, to talk about how kind of helping commissioners understand how you engage with the water plan and what your role could be in terms of convening conversations within your county or within your basin uh, as the case may be. And we had, um, uh, better get this right, Diane Johnson from the Eagle River Water and Sand District and Taylor Hawes from the Nature Conservancy came. Um, and then Jim Yon uh, came to uh, talk about sort of an agricultural perspective. And um, who am I missing, Russ? Oh, um, Kathy Chandler Henry spoke, she's Eagle County Commissioner. And so we had a great conversation there about just this situation, how, how you interact with the water plan as a sort of a uh, someone who's setting land use policy in your community and, um, you know, may not have a lot of direct water knowledge, but how do you help use your sort of authority that the people have given you to convene that conversation and help move, move the ball. Um, also had at our last space and round table a week or so ago, um, Amy came and, and did a great update on the Colorado River situation. People are really interested in that and they really appreciate having someone who's actually, you know, in the room, uh, party to these negotiations and also is so well versed in kind of what's going on with the hydrology. And then Chris Sturm was there too um, and gave his, um, I forget the exact title, but sort of the fire ready watershed conversation. Um, you know, really um, appreciated and I think help really helping our basin come to terms with the value of sort of watershed health and wildfire, not wildfire mitigation so much, but watershed health and having, uh, doing stream restoration work in anticipation of post-fire um, recovery. So that was great. And then also uh, Nora Flynn, who's new to the, to the, staff, many of you may not have met her yet, um, came with Kara from um, Wilson Water Group to Upper Arc to talk about the water plan last week. And uh, they did a great job. And uh, again, just really were nimble and able to, uh, Upper Arc can be sort of a rough crowd sometimes. And they were, they were really great. They, they did a wonderful job with it. And uh, as usual, kind of straighten us out on a few misconceptions. So Really appreciate them standing their ground, and and um, it was it's really helpful. And every time that I'll just finish by saying, every time that CWCB shows up in the basin, it helps so much for people to get the straight information and to humanize kind of the face of this organization, whether it's Becky or whether it's Nora, but it's uh, it's not just some bureaucratic agency that's cranking out weird ass ideas and everybody's being subjected to, you know, 90 degree policy turns or, you know, it just gets ridiculous. Some of the interpretation of what's going on. And it's just so great when you show up and you, you help people um, put a face on it and 
you're so reasonable and clear headed and um, coherent that it, it really helps for those of us who have to sort of kind of hold both hands and, uh, and uh, sometimes get stretched a little bit. So thank you all for, for all the time you've spent in our basin and uh, Russ for helping the whole state really with the helping county commissioners tune into this opportunity and this responsibility. So that's it for me. Thanks, I still really can't understand why the evening meeting we had on the water plan was painful, but. <laughs> I don't know, I was just sitting in a little motel room while everybody, there was an open bar. Everybody loves an evening meeting, <laughs> I just don't get it. Um, all right, well, thanks for that. Any questions for Director Felt? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, Director Scott. Was that a paid advertisement there? That was pretty good, Director <laughs> Felt. I want in on that, but I would echo, I would echo what Director Felt said. The, Staff is amazing, but really hats off to you as well, Director Felt, because it takes that person to get that, make that connection. I think you've done a lot of that. So, so thanks very much on that. Thank but you. It also, what you were talking about the snowpack reminded me of something that I wanted to include in my talk. I, Terracotta is down in the Rocky Ford area, good friends of mine, and visited with them before coming here. And they had indicated because the snowpack was 50% of what it should have been by the 1st of May, farmers down in that area. and. I know this is something that Director Mitchell was referring to. It had cut back anywhere between 10 to 30 percent voluntarily on planting crops because they were so concerned about what the water supplies were going to be. And so it again goes to that fact of how we're living within our means of what we expect the water supply to be. And I, I just I forgot to mention that, but wanted to include that. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's a great advertisement, um, backhanded advertisement for this aerial snow survey stuff. I know it's not be all and an end all, but uh, agriculture isn't the only industry that has to make these decisions before you know what's going to happen. And uh, I mean, we see it in certainly in fly fishing retail, like when you're going to take delivery of all this stuff when you haven't had much revenue since October uh, and you got to pay for it, you know, um, and to be able to refine those projections and have a better idea when you're going to have water and then how much uh, can it, it's important to many different industries and economic sectors. So um, I think I, I'm very uh, sympathetic to folks in the lower Arkansas basin who make these crop decisions and then everything changes on them and you kind of can't start over. You just got to go with it. Okay, <clears throat> Director Brody, you're up. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, Director Gibbs in his report yesterday mentioned that he had been appointed to the Federal Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission. And I think as a CWCB and as a state, we should be really proud that there were five Coloradans mm -hmm. named to that group representing different perspectives including um, one of my colleagues, Madeline McDonald, who's a senior watershed scientist uh, at, at Denver Water. And to me, it really speaks to Colorado's leadership um, and innovation in um, forming these um, diverse partnerships um, of state, federal, local, um, and uh, nonprofit and, and utility alliances uh, to pool resources and pool ideas and, and really prioritize and, and tackle um, these uh, watershed management issues. So again, I think um, it's a tribute uh, to those individuals and, and frankly to, to all of us as a state um, for being forward thinking on this issue. I also wanted to take a minute to congratulate the CWCB staff uh, and our consultants on the issuance of the draft water plan for public comment. I know that that was a huge lift. I know you all have been working incredibly hard for many, many months uh, to pull that draft together and to respond and react to comments you've heard from many of us. So um, kudos and, and congratulations for the great work. And I'm really excited to hear about what types of comments um, you and we are receiving uh, I think that public comment process is so critical to make sure that the plan really reflects and speaks to 
all of Colorado. Um, and so I'm, I'm really eager to hear updates from staff on what type of feedback you're hearing, um, what opportunities there might be to even continue to further uh, refine and, and develop the plan uh, so that it can truly be a document that guides us uh, for the next several years. One of the things that we've talked about at the board um, in terms of that plan is the need to think holistically as a state about our water resources, both from the quantity side and from the water quality side. And I wanted to bring to your attention um, a recent EPA health advisory is an example of how important that it is that we um, think holistically about our water resources and our, and our water health. Um, last month, EPA issued a health advisory for PFAS. I'm sure many of you have been hearing about PFAS or forever chemicals in the news. Um, and this really is an important, um, not just environmental health and public health issue, but it's a water quantity issue too, because um, while the EPA health advisory doesn't set um, hard limits for water utilities and for other water users in terms of um, the amount of PFAS that can be in their water, it is a harbinger uh, that uh, those limits are going to become more and more strict over time. Um, effectively, what EPA said in its health advisory is that there's no safe level of PFAS in drinking water specifically, uh, which means that um, as EPA translates those health advisories into uh, drinking water limits, um, there will likely be water utilities around the country, including here in Colorado, that are going to need to shift um, what water sources they're, they're using in order to supply their communities. Now, obviously none of us want to be in a position where we're providing water to people that isn't safe, that, that isn't acceptable to any of us. Um, but at the same time, um, this is going to, going to be a real challenge for us, and particularly for utilities that, that rely on, um, for example, groundwater sources that historically were contaminated by industrial activities or fires or firefighting foam, things that none of us as utilities have the opportunity to control. Um, or similarly, um, communities that might be downstream of major, major, um, major cities that might find effluent coming out of, of wastewater uh, systems um, that could potentially impact those of us downstream who rely on, on that water um, for irrigation and for other purposes. Uh, so I think um, in light of that health advisory, it's more critical than ever that we as the CWCB work closely with our partners at CDPHE and, and other agencies to come up with a holistic plan so that as we're making decisions, as the Water Quality Control Commission is making its decisions, that we're thinking holistically uh, about how to, um, how to preserve both the health and the availability of our water resources for all Colorado to enjoy. Um, finally, I wanted to give a quick update on uh, Denver Water's lead reduction program. And with that, I'm gonna, um, after that, I'll conclude my remarks and, and keep them brief uh, because I'm going to ask your indulgence at the next meeting uh, for a little bit more time for a, a more fulsome update. But um, the lead reduction program um, has a couple of big, um, big developments this year. Um, first is uh, we are in the process of renewing our variance with EPA to allow us to continue that variance. Um, when we first applied for the variance in 2019, uh, we had anticipated that it could take up to 15 years to get all of those lines out. We asked EPA for a 15-year variance, and they said, we'll give you three to demonstrate the effectiveness of the program. Uh, and so this is, you know, we are two and a half years in, we are in that variance renewal process. Uh, the reason I'm going to ask for a little bit more time at the next meeting is that I'm hoping uh, between now and then EPA is going to issue its draft of the variance renewal decision for public comment. Uh, and so once that's out, we can we can talk more about what that says and what it means, not just for Denver water, but but frankly, for all water utilities. Um, the other big development in the program uh, is that we are seeking federal funding. Um, and I, I want to put out a PSA for other water utilities that might have lead service lines in their service area to consider taking advantage of 
the historic funding opportunity in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, we, we have never seen funding at this level to replace lead service lines. Um, and it is a mix of, of both loans and, and grants. Uh, so we are, we are going to take full advantage of, of those resources at Denver Water and um, certainly want to take the opportunity you know, as the River District and, and CWCB are doing to uh, extend whatever knowledge and resources we can to help other water utilities go through that federal funding process. I'm hoping that by, by being out in front and being the lead um, that hopefully we can smooth out some of the, some of the bumps in the process um, for those who might wanna pursue the funding in the future. Um, I'll just say um, quickly that uh, our program is um, hitting uh, or exceeding all of the milestones that EPA had set for us, which we're really proud of. Uh, and so um, I'm very optimistic that we'll get a favorable decision out of EPA and I'll have more to share on that uh, at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Director Brody? Seeing none, we'll move to last but certainly not least, Director Dutton the Rio Grande. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to start my report by just thanking all of you. This I, I really love this part of the meeting. It's so fun to hear everybody's reports and just to be reminded that we all have just such different experiences and a diversity of knowledge. And I, I just love what everybody chooses to report because um, yeah, Jessica, you and I have, for example, have such different experiences in water, but it's really neat to sit at the same table and to be uh, working together on on these issues so sincerely thank you all um, thanks for letting me hang out with you <laughs> so i also want to um, thank some of the other directors for recent visits to the valley kelly thank you so much for for getting director gibbs and other dnr staff and director ryan thank you for joining in, in that tour and especially lauren was really i was so bummed to miss it but really glad uh to be able to know that you guys were getting to see a lot of cool things and hang out with a lot of a lot of really special people in the valley so thank you for taking the time to do that it means a lot and as director felt said you know when people show up in our little neck of the woods it just it's really special so thank you guys all for for being there um director ryan i also i know that your your comments yesterday uh, you're, you just like me have a self-deprecating sense of humor, but I did want you to know how much I always appreciate when you take us to school. And I thought the report about the, the measurement rules and kind of the what, why, how is really helpful and um, helpful for us to take back. But I think also helpful just that now that's forever on YouTube so we can send people to it if they have questions. And so thank you for doing that. Really appreciated it. And I thought it was really straightforward and interesting. A couple updates from from the San Luis Valley. We were really fortunate, I guess it was last month, to have a growing water smart workshop. And so this was a was a workshop that was funded in part by a Colorado Water Plan grant. The Salazar Center, the Babbitt Center, and the Sonoran Institute put on a three day event. There were there were representatives from the seven counties across the valley, and so it was about seventy five people showed up to to work together to really think about, you know, where are we now and, and how are we doing with regard to understanding the water resources that we have and where can we improve and really think through, you know, how can the San Luis Valley be, um, be a leader for each other, but, but maybe even inspire other people to, to really think through, you know, our, our, the way that we are considering land use policies and development codes with regard to water. And so that was a, it was a really fun conversation and I just really want to um, especially thank Kevin Reedy for his role in helping helping the organizers manage their grant and manage the program. And there's there's a lot of great um, great things that are coming from it. I was I was put on the Mineral County team. I was kind of um, kind of a floater, and so I was put with them. And we've already had a few meetings and talking about you know what does Mineral County need to do and where can we improve improve their future. So very exciting. Just really can't thank Kevin enough for that. Um, another another great thing that's happening is our roundtable meeting. You know, we continue to meet monthly. We continue to have monthly education topics. And so July's topic was watershed health. We had some articles, and then we had some really great presentations at our roundtable meeting last week about watershed health. And there's a tour tomorrow. So if anyone wants to impromptu come come to the San Luis Valley tomorrow, there's there will be a tour of the Trinchera Ranch. 
so that we can see some of their logging activities and efforts to restore Rio Grande cutthroat trout. So we're excited about that. It was also a neat coincidence that Chris Sturm was able to be in the valley uh, during the watershed health roundtable meeting. And so he presented on the wildfire, wildfire ready watersheds. Jeez, he challenged us to say that 10 times and I blew it. Um, so Chris, thanks so much for being there and for your work on that. Everybody always enjoys, you know, Chris's expertise and dry sense of humor. Nora Flynn and, and Kara Sobieski were with us the day before they were with you, Director Felt. And so I also want to echo just how much I appreciated them coming down. We actually did did a tour one of the days that we were there and made sure to hit up a bunch of the local Mennonite bakeries. So it was a little bit of water, a lot of bit of bread, but um, pretty pretty fun to have have those ladies down there and to really show them some of the great river restoration work that we are doing. Um, so I would I want to also I just want to tell a quick story. Um, in in June, I guess, yeah, I want to use the rest of my report to just highlight a really, really cool thing that happened in June and to really highlight one of our partner organizations, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, for they continually step up for our community and are a part of all these different things that we're doing to try to, you know, do more with less and really make the most of our of our water resources. And June, we had a huge example of that. So there's a there's an event that happened on June 11th, the Rio Trio. It's a, they call it the Valley Bottom Adventure Race because it's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cool things happen up in the mountains, but there, there aren't a lot, of, um, a lot of big events that happen down on the valley floor other than car shows and things. And so the staff at the city of Alamosa have put together this triathlon, which is a, it's a run, bike, paddle. And so another, another reason I wanted to highlight this for you is, you know, Director Brown talking about the the desire to add more infrastructure and, and, you know, some of these more accessible boat ramps on the Yampa, we've, we're, we have experienced that as well. And some of you may recall that the city of Alamosa came before us a little while ago, and they, they were able to get a Colorado water plan grant to build some boat ramps. So now we have this really neat boatable section in Alamosa, you know, it's this area where people are, are really connected to the river already, where it flows through town and the levee trails get a lot of traffic, but before the boat ramps, people weren't really getting in the river. And so now you can't keep them out of it. It's, it's really great to see. And so uh, the city of Alamosa put on this event for the first time last year. It was wildly popular. They capped it at 125 people, just recognizing that that many paddle boards and kayaks and you know whatever crafts people are using in the river at one time would, <laughs> would be a little bit hectic. Uh, and so, so they, they planned the event again. Yeah, it was a wild success last year. They planned it again for June 11th of this year, which I think by all accounts sounds pretty safe, right? Since the normal peak flows in the Rio Grande are on June 8th. So the 11th would be pretty great. Uh, but the river peaked on May 8th. And so we started having conversations about what is the, what is the minimum flow that they need for this event to successfully float boats and the organizers settled on, you know, past experiences and actually our boatable days study from, um, from our stream management plan, talking about how really 90 CFS is kind of the minimum we need. And even then it's going to be pretty painful, but we said, well, maybe that's part of the fun is that people have to drag their boats around some sandbars. Um, just kidding. It sounds terrible, but, <laughs> um, but it's, an, it's an adventure race. And so, so a week before, or maybe, I think maybe it was actually two weeks before the event, I, I, you know, pull up the daily sheet on my phone and the river had dropped in almost at a 65 CFS. And I was like, oh, curse word. If we don't do something, this is going to be a disaster. And so, um, so I called Craig Cotton and was like, okay, what can we do here? Cause there's only three ways we can move water through Alamosa. We can exchange water to the closed basin project. We can exchange water to a, a uh, reservoir on the Canaos River only if there are two live rivers or we can deliver water to the state line for the compact. And so Craig set the sideboards, it, for those of you that aren't besties with Craig, he's our division engineer. Um, <laughs> and he, he said, I won't, we can't do compact deliveries. I'll let you do the other two and here are the sideboards. So that was, it was really helpful that Craig was like, I'm here to help, but also there are rules, follow them and we'll do this. So I called Tony with Park, Parks and Wildlife and said, you know, what can you do? We can do a plateau exchange, closed basin exchange. 
Conservancy District is willing to kick out water for augmentation. Can CPW exchange water up to the closed basin or to Plateau? Tony was on vacation in Wisconsin and was getting on a boat to go fishing and ordering a Reuben at some lakeside group sandwich stand. But he, he said to me, he's like, if you figure it out, we'll do it. I'm like, all right. So I called the Bureau of Land Management and said, hey, I know you guys were going to exchange closed basin water later in the season, but can you change your plans completely and take it next weekend from CPW pretty please? And so, the, so Sue with the BLM said, I can, and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation will work with us. It would mean Fish and Wildlife Service would also have to change their plans and the Bureau would have to make water available. So everybody had to change all their plans. But Sue's like, yep, I'll handle it. And so then I called Nathan with the Kaneos Conservancy District and he said, yeah, we can take it up to Plateau. I think I'll have this exchange potential, but I'll let you know. So I think the thing to take away from this is that everybody said yes. Everyone said yes and. Nobody was like, come on, you know, what do you know? And everybody said, yeah, how can I help? And so a lot of other things happened. We actually did a test release to try to follow the, the water through the river because it wasn't just a matter of doing a release and high-fiving. It was, we actually needed it to get there for the event. Uh, and we'd never done it before. And so long story short, we ended up, the river was at 62 CFS the day before the event. By everybody working together, we had two state agencies, three federal agencies, and two conservancy districts. We were able to, we were able to take the flows from 62 CFS to 194 CFS, and the peak was exactly at 10 a.m. when the first boaters were getting in the water. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. And so I, I tell you this, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional because it was, I haven't cried in a while at a board meeting. <laughs> um, it was just really special. And I, Sue with the BLM, we were talking about it afterwards and I wrote down what she said because I knew I'd get emotional, but she, she said, you know, it wasn't a huge amount of water, but it was really complicated. And it proved that we can do a lot and we can make a lot of difference if we work together. And so anyway, sorry guys, I didn't expect actual tears. I knew my voice would crack. Um, but yeah, it's just really special to be part of the community and part of this larger community with you guys. And so thanks to CPW and for DWR for being so willing to make, make a difference for 200. Um, it's just 200 people, but it was a huge deal for the city of Alamosa and for the people in the Valley. And I think this is an example of how we can all, if we're willing to say yes, can make a difference and hearing about, you know, these low flows around the state, thinking through what resources we do have and how we make them um, work harder. So geez, sorry guys, I'm a little embarrassed here. But yeah, I guess, guess I had some tears that needed to get out. Um, anyway, pretty exciting thing that happened. So I just wanted to share that with you and brag on some of our state partners who really came through and also, uh, I think I'm oh, two minutes early, hot damn. Um, wanted to end my report just again by piling on to the thanks for staff. And if it's okay, guys, I thought, I think really, you know, we, yeah, I know the plan's not final, but holy cow, it took a lot of work to get here. And so um, maybe if the staff would stand up and if we could applaud you, everybody, because it's, you know, Russ, you're the one that lost all the sleep and and led the team, but I know that every single person in this room had a lot to do with the plan. And so thank you guys for getting it to this point. And um, I, we salute you. Thank you, Director Dutton. I know uh, Director Mitchell has something to say in response. So. <laughs> um, I, I think this board is not afraid of emotion. I think that's important as we, as, um, we move forward just in, in everything that we do that I, I think what makes us different is that we're all in on this. Yes. And I, I, as I thought about this meeting, I reflected on it last night. Oftentimes I, I kind of think about what, what came from, from the conversations and the days and, and the, the presentations. And, 
And then just hearing all of the director's reports this morning, I, I really think that partnerships are where the solutions are. And that's, that's where we're going to feel hope um, in these trying times. And so I think we have to remember also that those, those partnerships um, are, are, you have to, you have to nurture them, you have to care for them. And, and we all falter and make mistakes. And, um, but the foundation of those partnerships is incredibly important. So um, I, I think as, as I, I think about what I'll be thinking tonight um, about how this meeting went and um, what was important and what are the takeaways and then what takeaways do I put in the daily work that, that we're doing in, in, in the agency, it, it is gonna be that. And so I appreciate the sharing. The emotion is not um, foreign to any of us. I think everyone here has seen everyone shed a tear. So, um, and it's because we do important work and these are trying yeah. times. So don't lose hope. It's a bit of a rite of passage around here. You've got to cry to be part of the board officially, right? <laughs> right, no, I mean, I, I wasn't quite ready to expose all of your emotions, but <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes real quick to share um, just a concept that I know I've run past some of you board members and don't worry, it is not um, violating any open meetings laws because it doesn't have anything to do with decisions, but in the spirit of hope and exchange, um, been considering how we can use our board meetings to do some um, forum conversations. I don't know if we call them table topics or um, you know, round table discussions or learning lunches or, or whatever, but so far the, the response has been pretty positive and, and what that I think would look like and open for feedback is uh, just inviting, you know, picking a topic at each board member at each board meeting, you know, one, maybe two, depending on what the schedule looks like, and then um, putting it on the board to um, come up come up with the topic and then come up with people to invite to join us at the table and just talk about um, their expertise in whatever uh, project or area of work they're in. And it can be, you know, from all over the state, from all over the country, whatever is of interest and, and just doing that um, for our own education, for um, the education of, of whoever wants to listen in on, on the board meetings and just, just, create some more partnerships and connections and sharing. And I know we have an expert staff. And so wherever they would like to be involved in those uh, panels or forums, I think it'd be a great opportunity to show off some of the work that we don't get to hear about um, necessarily during the meetings. Um, but we've done a great job really consolidating the work we do over the last year or two with our grants and so we i think find ourselves with some time to reflect on where we're at um, in the state and and how we can get some more information across to our partners and our water users and that was one concept that uh, we threw out there so um stay tuned for that hopefully we'll be able to debut something in september when we're down in durango and i uh, just you know as many of you know, I come up with some crazy ideas and I appreciate you letting me go with this one and we'll see how it, how it shines or, you know, if it doesn't work, that's fine too. <laughs> that's the thing with ideas. Okay, so we'll, unless anyone has anything to say, okay, then we'll go ahead and move to morning break and see y'all back here about 1015. Recording stopped.
Rob Beal, CWCB staff. And I'm presenting agenda, agenda item 15A. Um, and this is a uh, final action on the uncontested interim flow appropriation on Deep Creek and Water Division 6. On January 24, 2022, the board formed its intent to appropriate ISF water rates on a segment of Deep Creek from its headwaters down to the confluence with Steamboat Lake, pursuant to Rule 5D of the in-stream flow and natural lake level program rules, notice was sent of the board's action on January 31st. This notice provided all parties with the deadline to file a notice to contest, and um, no later than March 31st, and the CWCB staff received no such notices. As identified in staff's memo before the January meeting, representative from the Hans Peak, <clears throat> excuse me, Water Coalition reached out to staff, uh, indicating that they wanted the opportunity to identify and file for water rights on natural springs in the vicinity of the recommended Deep Creek ISF. Um, so when requesting the board to form its intent to appropriate, staff did mention that action would be taken in 2022 on this item, but not before the members of the coalition had a chance to go out and survey and see if they need to file on some small spring rights in the area. So the coalition notified us uh, recently that they did conduct their survey of the area and they don't plan to file for any additional water rights at this time, that their conditional water rights that they have are sufficient and that they're grateful for the board allowing this extra time for them to conduct the survey, but they have no objection to the recommendation moving forward with an appropriation date of uh, January 24th, 2022. So with this in mind, um, staff would request that the board make the following determinations and take the following actions on the Deep Creek appropriation identified in table one. Um, the information necessary to support these determinations is contained in staff's memo. The recommendation letters and documentations submitted by the Bureau of Land Management and the staff's memo and presentation provided at the January 2020, January 24th, 2022 board meeting. And so those determinations are one, Determined pursuant to 3792.1023, that for the Deep Creek ISF appropriation identified in Table 1, A, there is a natural environment that can be preserved to a reasonable degree with the recommended water rights if granted. B, the natural environment will be preserved to a reasonable degree by the water available for the recommended appropriation. And C, such a natural environment can exist without material injury to existing water rights. Also, two, pursuant to rule ISF rule. Uh, 5F established January 24th, 2022 as the appropriation date for these water rights. And then finally request staff work with the Colorado Attorney General's office to file applications for this water right in water court by the end of this calendar year. So with that, I can answer any questions that you may have on this uh, staff recommendation. Any questions for Rob? Rob, thank you again. Um, as I always say, your outreach work, just really appreciate it. And uh, I know that uh, it went a long way with this particular ISF, so thanks. Director Dutton. If there are no further questions or discussion, I would make a motion that we approve staff recommendations on agenda item 15A. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hawkins. Uh, I have a motion and a second on the floor to approve staff recommendation on agenda item 15A. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Motion carries, thank you. Uh, you're still here, agenda item I'm still 15B. here. So this is 15B. Go ahead. So once again, for the record, Rob Veal, CWCB staff, and this is agenda item 15B, where it's an action item on the Spring Creek ISF appropriation, which is located in Water Division 4. So a lot of background on this one. So staff's been working on the Spring Creek ISF recommendation with the BLM since 2017. Um, this is a very remote area. Um, and communication with the local uh, small group of local stakeholders has been challenging. Um, so staff from the CWCB, BLM, DWR, we held a meeting in person with the stakeholders to kind of discuss potential concerns that they would have for this ISF recommendation back in May of 2021. Um, staff believed at this meeting that everyone was on the same page and that the requested and 
So requested from the board to form their intent to appropriate the January 20, uh, 22 meeting. Um, staff was caught off guard with a request um, sent uh, at the beginning of May um, asking for this appropriation not to move forward. Um, unfortunately, staff didn't have enough time to kind of process that request and discuss with the BLM before the May meeting for an action item. Um, but we did provide an update of kind of the, the process that had been going on with this appropriation. So after the May meeting, staff met with um, staff of the BLM and a kind of mutual decision was made that since the board had not taken final action on this appropriation yet, it would be best to request that the board cancel their intent to appropriate on Spring Creek at the July meeting. Um, staff remains confident in the data that was collected and analyzed and may bring this recommendation back to the board at a future date. Um, and if this were to occur, the administrative process would just start from the beginning. So you'd have to reform your intent to appropriate again. Um, staff believes that there's a low risk of water development to occur in this area in the near future. Um, and due to its remoteness and the small amount of private lands located near the proposed um, Spring Creek ISF. So with all this in mind, um, staff recommends that the board cancel its an intent to appropriate an ISF water right on the following reach of Spring Creek listed in the table below. With that, I can try to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Rob? Director Hawkins? Thank you, Rob, and thanks to you and to Roy and others at the BLM for, for work on this. Um, I wanted to share my perspective with the board in case that's helpful before we um, take a vote on this. Um, I am not comfortable supporting canceling um, our intent to appropriate based on the fact that we received an opposition letter from some of the local state holders. Um, I think we have processes, everything from 1023B to um, the formal way that we consider opposition. I think it's really important for us to follow those rules. What I am comfortable with is taking a recommendation from staff and the BLM um, really based on their analysis of the low risk of water development and the request, um, which I understand to be largely based on where we put our staff resources. So where, where it's most important for our, our staff to be focusing efforts. Um, and I would note that the project list from the stream management planning effort on the San Miguel um, identifies a ton of good work, including more voluntary approaches to flow restoration. Um, so just to make this clear, I think we have processes that we use for opposition. It's very important for us to use the processes that we have. Um, I'll pause to see if there's any discussion that we need to have before I make a motion. Members of the board, do you have any thoughts in response to Celine's comments? Director Brody? So, Thank you for sharing that perspective. I just wanna make sure I understand what what your um, recommendation is then on this item. Is it that we move forward with a cancellation or that we continue to pursue uh, this in-stream flow and um, allow any opposition to be worked out in the ordinary course? If I may, I am... Um... I'm very supportive of the staff's recommendation. I really see it as a decision that we're making of where we're deploying our resources, including staff resources within the state. Um, I think that if the, the staff and the BLM would like to bring this back to us after taking some time, um, I'm open to that. But I just want to be really clear. I'm supportive of this really based off of you know, recommendations on how we use our, our staff resources and priorities and not simply because there was an opposition letter filed outside of the normal process. Thanks for that clarification. Are there any further questions, comments? Okay, go ahead with your motion, Director Hawkins. I would move to approve staff recommendation on agenda item 15B. Thank you. Is there a second? Director Dutton with the second. The motion and a second on the floor to approve staff recommendation on item 15B. 
Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Pete, you're welcome to join us um, on agenda item 16, proposed one year implementation of previously approved Garfield County water lease agreement to Rudai Reservoir for in stream flow use on the 15 mile reach in water division five. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> members of the board. Good morning. Uh, good to see you all. For the record, my name is Pete Conovitz, CWCB staff, and I'm going to be presenting a request for a one year lease with Garfield County. Uh, for Rudai Reservoir water that would be released for in-stream flow use in the 15 mile reach. This is an action item, so we'll be asking your approval today. So if you recall back to the May board meeting, the board approved a one-year lease with the Ute Water Conservancy District for Rudai Reservoir water for in-stream flow use. Uh, a Garfield County lease would operate very similarly. Uh, in that the lease water would be used to supplement existing CWCB in-stream flow water rights in the 15 mile reach, as well as help meet Fish and Wildlife Service flow targets uh, for endangered species, particularly the Colorado pike minnow and the razorback sucker uh, are known to inhabit that reach. Uh, the target flows set by the Fish and Wildlife Service are 1,480 CFS in July, 810 CFS from August through October. Um, those are dry year targets, obviously, and those targets are not being met currently. I believe the flows in the Colorado right now at Palisade are around 600 CFS, and I think the native flows are projected to be dropping. Um, also similar to the Ute lease, in 2020, the board and uh, Garfield County entered into the original, an original 2020 water lease agreement for this water. That agreement contemplated uh, four renewals, the first renewal was implemented last year in 2021, so this would be the second renewal under that original agreement. Um, the water will be available to pass through the Rudai Reservoir power plant on its way down to the 15 mile reach, generating a hydropower benefit. It would also be available to run through the Orchard Mesa power plant. Uh, however, that facility is offline right now for repairs, and I understand it won't be back online until November. So again, here's a location map. I know you're all very familiar with the geography, but you can see Rudai Reservoir on the right-hand side. The water would be released down to the frying pan into the Roaring Fork, where it would go to the main stem, down to the 15-mile reach, which starts above uh, the city of Grand Junction and extends down to the confluence with the Gunnison River. So the lease amount we're talking about is 350 acre feet. Uh, and the cost would be $45.90 per acre foot. Um, the agreement does not guarantee a minimum amount similar to the Ute, but all signs are pointing to the full 350 acre feet being available this year. Um, as with the Ute again, the lease would be paid for out of the Species Conservation Trust Fund. Um, the Trust Fund project bill was signed by the governor in June, and it allocates $250,000 total towards acquiring water in Rudai Reservoir for in-stream flow use on the 15 mile reach. So we would also coordinate with Fish and Wildlife Service and Bureau of Reclamation staff on the timing and rate of releases. So this leased water is kind of, would be part of a larger water portfolio of water available to the recovery program. There's water pools stored in Granby, Wolford Mountain. There's additional water in Rudai. So that all gets kind of combined together and is used to you know, uh, to uh, supply releases to, to help support those target flows. Um, I think with the Ute water, we're hoping there might be up to 6,000 acre feet available. So all said and done, I think the state's leases comprise about 25% of the total water availability uh, to the recovery program this year. We also are going to coordinate with CPW on releases so that releases don't impact recreational fishing uh, in the frying pan uh, below the reservoir. And we are gonna present on this lease and operations to the annual Rudai Reservoir Operations Meeting hosted by the Bureau of Rec Reclamation. And I believe that meeting is uh, gonna be held on August 11th uh, in Basalt. So with that, the rec 
recommendation is that the board approve a one-year implementation of the previously approved water lease agreement to lease up to 350 acre feet of water stored in Rudai Reservoir from Garfield County at a cost of $45.90 per acre foot and in authorizing an expenditure of up to $16,065 from the Species Conservation Trust Fund subject to the conditions that releases uh, from the reservoir don't exceed 300 CFS or cause uh, flows in the frying pan to exceed 350 CFS. Again, this is to minimize impacts to the fishery. Um, and then we will coordinate weekly with CPW on those releases to ensure that those conditions are met. And with that, I'm happy to try and answer any questions or hear comments from the board. Thanks, Pete. Any questions for Pete on this agenda item? Yep, Director Sakata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Pete, I'm looking at the original lease. It, there's a paragraph in there that says that an, an amendment will be added to explain the renewability part of Correct. it. Correct. Did I miss that in what you provided the board, or is that something you'll be adding later? So the way we're, we'd like to operate this year is we were um, given new guidance from contracting that we can execute these renewals via purchase order, which gives us a lot of flexibility. So we're going to elect to do that, um, and we've gotten Garfield County's um, approval to do so. So we're going to execute it not with a renewal amendment to the original contract, but via purchase order. Okay, thank you. Any other further questions? Yep, Director Boucher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move <clears throat> um, to um, approve staff recommendation on agenda item 16. Uh, I have a motion by Director Boucher and a second by Director Hawkins. Um, any discussion on the motion to approve agenda item 16 staff recommendation? Yes, Director Hawkins. I can't help but to say this is just an excellent project. And so I wanted to give you feedback from the board that silence does not mean that we're not excited <laughs> about it. It just means that some of us have seen this before. We're all thumbs up, I think. <laughs> thank you. Great point, Director Hawkins, thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Um, looks like our friend Kirk is up on agenda item 17, financial matters, construction fund and severance tax, perpetual base fund. Good Welcome. morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, before I jump into the uh, money side of things, um, as was mentioned yesterday by Deputy Howell, or uh, uh, Deputy Director Howell, the mullet competition is coming up, and um, I'm thinking of entering, but I need a sponsor. So I'm looking to this group to see if maybe I can count on you all. There's one. I'm thinking maybe Cicada Farms would look good right here when I compete for that. Um, okay, a, a couple of housekeeping items. I wanted to introduce the board to uh, Joshua Godwin. He's behind me here. Joshua will be taking over for Rachel in, uh, on August 1st. Uh, because the board was uh, meeting close here. He works for the city of Aurora now, and he'll be starting with us uh, shortly. So you'll see him in September, probably uh, down in Durango. So we'll see if we can get hit, hit the ground running there. So he will be representing primarily the Arkansas Basin. Uh, so Director Felt, you'll probably see him down in your neck of the woods uh, frequently. Um, I wanted to mention that this uh, spreadsheet that you're looking at for construction fund and severance tax is the end of the year report. Uh, each year I struggle with what to share with the board, where we have been or where we're going. And a lot of times when I share where we're going, there's not a lot of information because this is the first board meeting after we um, end the fiscal year. And a lot of times there's not a lot of closing information yet at this time. So the timing of this board meeting is a little bit unique. Um, and, and a reminder that we will be meeting in September at the Finance Committee. Uh, there's still some question about what day that will be. I think we're working on a virtual version of that uh, the week before the board meeting, and I'm, uh, I'm sure Viola will be coordinating that with you all. 
And at that time, we'll be talking about what will begin filling this out for the September uh, uh, meeting and then the November projects bill discussion. And with the uh, this additional funding that we've seen out of severance tax, I'm sure we'll have uh, a lot of stuff to be talking about. So to start off the uh, the top of the spreadsheet, I'm just going to highlight some of the stuff we, we try to do our best to predict what we're going to have at the end of the year and similar to severance tax, a lot of money comes in that is not planned, uh, principal prepayment, things like that come in from loans. Um, and then we also have unknowns with expenses as they occur over the year. So starting at the top of the construction fund page, one of the items I want to highlight is that 24 million uh, estimate of money coming in in last fiscal year. We typically estimate that about 16 million. So we're already $8 million in excess revenue that came in primarily from uh, principal prepayments and um, maybe even loan closeouts, paid in fulls that happen. Uh, and so even that number is hard to predict. The, the number right below that, the 12 million cash in from FML, that's a little bit higher than we have normally seen as well. Normally in the last few years, it's been around, around eight, nine million. So it's interesting that it, it tracks with this increase in severance tax dollars. I don't know that there's a direct tie, but there's an additional 3 million that came in that uh, revenue source this year. Moving down the list, you can see we've done $20 million in new loans out of the construction fund. And on the other page, about 6 million in severance tax loans. So that's about 27 million. That's a little low for us. We're typically in that 30 to $40 million range of total loans for the year. Moving down to, um, I've highlighted on my notes here to mention, uh, it's, it's kind of faint there, but it's line 18, where we talk about that 2.65 million auto refresh budget. You go all the way to the right, you see uh, 1, 1.3 million in actual expenses. What that is, is the statute has established some items that we annually fund and this board approves. And I'm gonna give you the list of those items. And some of them you've seen presentations even in this board meeting. So the Wild and Scenic Fund is in statute to 400,000. In-stream flow acquisitions is a million. Uh, stream engage um, work is 250,000. Feasibility study grants is a $500,000 fund and flood and drought um, Flood and drought fund is uh, 500,000. So when you add all those up, that's at 2.7 million. We've only used about 1.3 of that this last year. And so these, all these numbers start coming into play at the end of the year when we add up where we are. So I think I'm gonna move over to the construction fund. I'm sorry, the severance tax perpetual base fund. Looking at, I guess I didn't have a number on that, uh, cash from severance tax revenue, which is what we've been talking about last, last few days. Um, that number, um, that 88.8 million, I use an average every year when I do my um, estimation of how much non-reimbursable money we have available for the projects bill. And I usually use 35 million. And so you can see that's considerably higher than that. Um, however, I use that 35 million as an average. Even this 88 million is considerably high when you add in last year's zero and this year's 88. That's still a pretty big number for, uh, for revenue coming in from severance tax. Oh, and right above that line, that cash in from treasury interest and loan P&I, that 35 million, I typically uh, use about 17 million there. So again, a lot of money has come in in excess of our routine repayments, which is creating a large number at the bottom of both of these spreadsheets. That, um, and then back to that 88.8 .8 million, um, that'll be part of this finance committee conversation. Just a reminder to the board, anything other than the WSRF transfer that uh, happened yesterday, it's all gotta go into the projects bill for authorization. So as we think through what uh, the board is looking at doing with those funds, we need to consider it will go through our bill. And it's interesting, I've, I've tried, I've been preparing for you all to ask, why is severance tax so high, which, you know, I don't have an answer to that, but it is coincidental that it tracks about the time frame that Russ Sands and his staff has been traveling around the state touting the, uh, the new water plant update. So I'm, I'm not sure if we'll see a downturn once 
once they stay back here. Do it a great job. Uh, the last item I wanted to point out is the WSRF transfer budgeted that 20 million. A reminder, we approved, or the board approved 3 million before, we just added 17 and that's why I put that 20 in there. It's a little bit confusing if you keep going to the right. I have July 2023 authorization. So I'm, I'm having trouble with what fiscal year to tie that to. And so I, it's a little bit confusing. We're gonna tie it, it'll come out of our uh, spreadsheet in fiscal year 2023 and so that's why it's in there like that so with that said i'm happy to answer any questions okay thank you oh yep there we go uh director anderson i saw your hand first go ahead kurt uh, i don't know but i would think severance tax in some way, way would be uh dependent on on uh, fuel prices and so forth. And we're seeing, you know, crazy increase there. Isn't that the case with some of those? I don't have any additional information on that. Um, I, I would think it tracks some with that, but I know production's a, a critical piece of that as well. And I know that um, we struggle, I, I've shown you that graph as it bounces up and down. There is a lag in in things as well, because there is a um, local tax credit associated with the, the revenues on that that tends to lag a couple years. And so when things are low, two years later, they're really high and they just continue to track that trend and it bounces it even higher. So I, it's very possible that the high gas prices are also a contributor. Director Hawkins, do you have any Thanks, Kirk. That was helpful. I have sort of a big picture question that might be pointing towards the finance committee meeting. Um, other than the decisions we've made about WSRF, are there things that we should be thinking about on the board about how to use times of relative plenty to stabilize the financial health of our spending? And as part of that, are there projects that this would be a particularly opportune time to think about advancing through the projects bill given what we've heard today my answers to that is yes i think it is a good opportunity and we've had we've had the luxury of um, managing these funds well over the years and having uh having the successes on the loan side um, I, I will share with this board, I am a little concerned when we put a lot of money into the grant programs, it reduces the demand on loans. Um, I've been asked it years ago if that was a direct tie and I can't really provide a number, but it makes sense that if there's an opportunity for the grants, it's, it could have uh, an impact on our ability to find borrowers. Um, and I think we've got to get a little creative as well on how we can utilize both together better. I've got some ideas that, uh, that I may share with uh, Director Mitchell and see if, if they make any sense. But um, yeah, I think we, we don't want to be, we don't want to be so, so large and we're not utilizing the money. Having it sit in treasury is not, not ideal. And so um, the, the balances that you're seeing on this sheet is unreserved money. So it is not tied to any particular project at this time. And I think Yes, big project time, I think, is important if it's something that can have a statewide impact, so. That was the question. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're on to agenda item 18, water project loans. Welcome, Cole. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, for the record, Cole Bedford, CWCB staff, this is agenda item 18A. It is an action item. Uh, and this is the water project loan request for the siphon repair project coming to us from the Grandview Irrigation Company uh, in Fremont County. So just a couple of big picture items on this project. Uh, it's out in division two. Uh, the borrowers, the Grandview Irrigation Company and the requested loan amount for this project is $353,000. The loan terms that they're requesting are 30 years at our at a blended interest rate of 2.25%. And on this one, I've been working with Manny Cologne. He's the president of the company. And we're a few minutes early, so I don't think we have Manny online. 
Oh, is he? Okay. Um, so here's a map of the project location. The Grandview Irrigation Ditch uh, serves 54 shareholders in Canyon City. Uh, the head of the ditch system has a 48 inch pipe siphon that carries water under a highway and some commercial developments. And last fall, they noticed some standing water in one of the parking lots. And so over the winter, they did some investigations with a contractor and discovered that they had about 130 joints in that pipe that needed to be repaired. So they got started on that work uh, right away so that they could run water this season, and they are. And then they've got a fair bit left that they need to do post-season. And so they're going to finish up that work when the water turns off here. So here's the, the project financials. The total project cost is $350,000, and the loan will cover that entire amount. With the 1% service fee, that's $353,000. And again, the interest rate they qualify for is 2.25%. The collateral will consist of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the financial ratios indicate that they're a strong borrower and the collateral will consist of a pledge of revenues backed by a rate covenant and the project itself. And so uh, lastly, uh, here's staff recommendation. Uh, I can take any questions and uh, if Manny is available, he can too. Any questions for Cole or Manny? Seeing none, go ahead, Director Falk. Um, Madam Chair, this is a this is a great project that's really needed, uh, very much down in the Canyon City area, and I would move approval of it of the staff recommendation on this item, which is eighteen A. Thank you. I have a second. You guys tie you're right across from each other, so it's hard. Um, but we're going to give it to Director Hawkins. Thank you. So uh, motion on the table for staff recommendation on agenda item 18A, second by Director Dutton. Is there any discussion? Director Dutton? I, I just wondered, since Manny took time out of his day to be with us, if he had any anything to add? Absolutely. Manny? Nope. All right, we'll move on. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Motion carries, thank you. And you're still up with us for One agenda more. item 18B, Sunnyside Park Ditch Company. Okay, uh, again, for the record, Cole Bedford, CWCB staff. This is agenda item 18B, another uh, action item. And this is loan project, well, Water project loan request from the Sunnyside Park Ditch Company, and this is their piping project, and they're in Chafee County, just upstream. Uh, so this one's also in Division Two. Uh, the Sunnyside Park Ditch Company operates the Sunnyside Park Ditch, just northwest of Salida. Uh, the loan amount for their piping project that they're asking for is six hundred fifty-four thousand four hundred eighty dollars, and the terms for theirs are ten years at a reduced agricultural rate of one. 1.00%. And since they're opting for the 10 year loan, uh, that's quite a bit lower than what our standard 30 year would be. Uh, in working on this one, I've been talking with Nancy Roberts. She's the president of the company and Kathy Rorick. She's the treasurer. Um, we may have one or both of them on as well. Uh, so here's the project location on this one. Like I said, just northwest of Salida. Uh, on the Arkansas, it's where 285 and 291 meet. And the Sunnyside Park Ditch Company operates the ditch. In red here is a 3,000 foot stretch that they're hoping to replace with a pipeline. And it's, it's right on a kind of a steep portion of the bank. It's between the river and some commercial developments there. And there it's at risk of sliding. So by putting this ditch in, they'll be underneath the surface and they'll be protected a little bit better. Uh, here's the project financials on this one. So the entire project cost is $934,539, just shy of a million. And they've got a few different grants that are going to pay out throughout the project, uh, WSRF from our programs, and then another couple from other outside entities. So the maximum loan amount they need on this one is just the $654,480 with our service fee. 
and I don't have it on the slide here, but they're also getting a grant from NRCS, which will pay out at the end of the project. So they're, um, the table I've got on the last page or so shows that their long-term repayment is 160. It's quite a bit lower. So they're going to use that NRCS money at the end of the project to pay down the principal and then just repay over their 10-year period that smaller amount. Uh, it, it's 161,775. And so that'll be at that 1% reduced ag rate for 10 years. The financial ratios indicate that they're an average borrower and the collateral will consist of a pledge of revenues backed by a rate covenant and the project itself. And here is staff recommendation on this one. Thank you, Cole. Is there anyone that has joined us? Um, this is Nancy Roberts. I thank you very much for considering our project um, for the loan and for giving us the grant earlier this year. Um, I just feel like I need to correct. I am not the president of the ditch. The president of the ditch is Brady Everett, um, but I've been the one working on all the loans, on all the grants and loans. Thank you very much. Thanks for that clarification. Go ahead, Director Felt. Um, Madam Chair, this, this project is um, a, a really important one. If you've ever driven the, what you might call the diagonal highway into Salida, Highway 291, that kind of goes from the Northwest coming into town. Um, you've probably enjoyed those beautiful irrigated hay meadows on either side of the road. We have, we have three significant ditches that irrigate that area and the sunny side is one of those and a really critical one. We've, um, our community, truly the Chafee County community has funded part of this project through our Chafee Common Ground Program, which is our conservation finance measure that we passed several years ago. And, you know, one of the goals of that is really trying to help agriculture be successful and to protect working lands. And, and this project um, will do both. These lands are um, being encroached upon by development and this ditch has been encroached upon by development to the point where really need to do a project like this piping for them to be sustainable in the long term. And so uh, it's a good amount of money, but it, I just want you to know that our community has actually stepped up with local match and Nancy can correct me, but I, I, my recollection is that was around $100,000 uh, that we put forward on this. So anyway, I would, with that, I would move approval of item uh, or staff recommendation on item 18B. Thank you. And I have a second by Director Bruchet. Um, is there any discussion on staff approval of agenda item 18B? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cole. Thanks, Nancy. All right. Captain Russ. <laughs> Heather did such a nice job thanking you that I guess I can just cross off my thank you to you <laughs> now, but in all seriousness, um, I know that I in particular put you through the ringer after the first draft that I read. And although it was certainly an exceptional um, first draft, I know that we gave you a lot to think about as a board and uh, you and, and the consultant and staff were super nimble and um, really, you know, took the comments to heart. And I think we're all just really, if we haven't told you enough, appreciative of you, um, you know, taking our reflections and making them a reality. And I also just really appreciate this board, as Director Felt mentioned earlier, taking out an evening um, and really getting clear around what our goals for the water plan were and, and making sure that we were really clear to staff about what we wanted this final draft to look like. And I think you just really helped us kind of corral ourselves into um, clear goals of this 10 year water plan. And, you know, I, I sent out an email to my basin round table because I couldn't join them at their last meeting. And you know, just so many things stood out to me in the draft uh, as uh, just being highlights and 
when I was going through back through the final draft and, and writing my favorite parts, um, I had to kind of stop after a while because I just think it, it's so well done and it is a totally new plan from our original water plan. I think it's very readable. I'm really excited to have the annual operating um, strategic plan available to this board as of 2023 and then future boards as they go through the 10 year cycle and I just can't give you enough kudos for how it looked and how you all were able to cut down on words and um, I think that's always you know appreciated for everybody that's going to end up reading both the summary and the report and so just miles of thank yous um, and we look forward to hearing whatever update you have for us today. So you have the floor. I appreciate it. Um, Russ Sands for the record and agenda item 19. And thanks back to you. I, I, I'm i terrible with notes. so I will probably forget to thank some people, but it, it goes both ways. So the um, <laughs> the tough comments, the all the comments were so appreciated because I think it just created a better product in the end. Um, and we were going to hear it somewhere, you know, and honestly better to hear it one-on-one -on -one and fix that stuff before it got out um, to, which were honestly probably just, we didn't think of it that way. Or I, I think we had a lot of really good comments from all of you. So thank you so much. I also have to say there were a lot of people not standing and I will not remember everybody's name, but Amy, Emily, um, everybody at this table, including uh, Director Gibbs and, and um, Deputy Director R, R, R. Kelly um, and <laughs> Kevin Ryan and the AG's, like everyone in the AG's office, um, CPW, CDA, uh, I mean, the CDPHE, we had just so many great partners along the way. Rob's team, Brandy, um, Kara, now on, on the IFWE side as well. Everybody at CWCB was in some way involved. So, um, and many agencies outside of CWCB. So um, many thanks to everybody on that front. So I will give you a quick update of just however quick it is. I, I took some liberties with pictures because you are always so great with pictures in your presentations on, on the director's report outs. Um, and I thought it would be a little fun, but as you know, the public comment period started June 30th and ends on September 30th. So we have 90 days. Um, that's a pretty substantial amount of time, but it gives people um, more time to read, even though it's half the length, it's still long. Um, people who aren't familiar with the first plan pick this up when we have a draft in their hand, they're like, wow, it's, it's really big. I'm like, wow, it was really big before. <laughs> it's half the weight, um, half the size. Um, so we will be pushing to have a final kind of, I think per our wig, um, our wildly important goal on the governor's desk in, in December, but really goes to the board for approval in January. Um, we've been making the roadshow. In fact, you might, I, I have been sleeping more. It's amazing, but um, I, I didn't want to let off the gas. As soon as the plan was out, we had multiple events the day that it came out. My favorite one got canceled, I will say, but there was going to be a live screening of Encanto uh, where we were going to have a booth. And I was a little sad <laughs> that we couldn't go to that, but we had, um, you know, all my team has been amazing. Uh, Elizabeth went to Carbondale. Uh, Elizabeth Skoder on my team went to Carbondale that same day. Um, that we were out in Breckenridge. Um, our newest hire, who is kind of Sam's backfill for the roundtable liaison position, uh, Jeff Rodriguez, joined our team and was just kind of scrambling to figure out what is this crazy thing that we do. And uh, it was a, a very crazy week to start with the launch of the water plan, but did great. So um, a lot of things happening as we've been going around um, that weekend, particularly, I, I went to three different counties. So I went to um, I, I staffed events and did a booth um, really a, a little bit on the fly and met a lot of great people that were very kind to me and um, giving me some space, but we went to Paonia and had a booth there. And then that led to kind of a connection with Big Bee's Orchard and they invited us to go to the Crested Butte Farmer's Market with them. And so we staffed that. So there are a lot of pictures of food there, uh, Robert, uh, Director Scotta. And um, then we went to Leadville and it was just kind of, <laughs> I was really uh, struggling. I was like, I want to fit in one more. I think I can make it happen. And then reached out to uh, uh, Commissioner Sarah Mudge and she's like, yeah, we have an event, come, come up here. So we went and did a Leadville event too and went for their firecracker 5K. So that was how I spent 4th of July, which was really fun. Actually, I met a lot of good people across the state. Um, as we've been going to round tables or talking to people really kind of harping on these 50 actions that are the partner actions and really trying to kind of empower people that we need them to help us. The way that we innovate, the way that we take things forward. Um, a lot of the comments we're hearing online, 
come in for a grant, help us do this, you know, to start an idea, start something at the local level. I quote you all the time, director felt that the magic, the good stuff happens at the local level. And I think that's so true or local control state and really trying to, to kind of strike that balance of where we can be supportive, um, but where we can also empower and put tools increasingly at the hands of local um, authority or just stakeholders that can help drive things forward. And then also kind of highlighting the 50 agency actions. I think um, several of those people, uh, probably everywhere, top issues are hard not to think about Colorado River, of course, that's probably always number one. A lot of concern about just water use in cities and turf. A lot of, uh, and I'll touch on this in a minute too, of just total use in the state and people are surprised about, um, you know, agriculture using the most sometimes. And I think we have probably a road to go there of really kind of helping people make that transition of, Yes, ag maybe uses the most water, but a lot of that is return flows. Um, you know that potentially, you know, as we look at this this future, and ag always says they have a target on their back that it might be more about the ag we're going to protect and not what we're going to take from ag. What can we do for ag? Is a message that I've tried to spread. Um, we also talk about, um, I think, at every roundtable, especially in light of Colorado River issues, that and this is kind of a, a version of a slide. Uh, I've shown you before, but then you know, those three images at the top really being the, the kind of the Hayman fire 2002 drought and then kind of subsequent fires and drought years like we're, we're, we're living through now. Um, but this is just central to the plan and still is central to the plan. We're still talking about 4.2 degree Fahrenheit increase by 2050 potentially. We're still talking about higher population uh, growth than actually the most recent STO, our state demographer office uh, projections are showing. And I think that just this trend towards aridity, these stats really stood out to me, just was working on a presentation the other day, I think these were on Forestry's website, but, um, or at least one of these, but six of the eight warmest years since 2012, and 15 of the 20 biggest fires since 2012, and we've talked so much about 2002 being that kind of um, starting point of really a, a lot of um, major changes in the state of how we think about water policy, but just think of the track that we're on right now, and we're living through this, and everybody's feeling it. Um, we do have four online listening sessions. Director Sakata, I saw you scribbling these down. You don't have to, to scribble. And these are all up online as well. Um, but they're all 4 to 6 p.m. We decided to make them online just to make sure that the audio would be perfect, that we could record them, um, that anybody that wanted to participate could, and also taking a cue from our partners at CDPHE, making sure that we had translation capabilities for each of these. So uh, we will have kind of a, a Spanish trans, uh, translation channel for each of these as well for anybody that wants to call in and give input. Uh, we did some listening sessions. Uh, we called them listening sessions uh, at the start of this process for a scoping phase for the water plan. That had a little bit more of a flavor of presentation and really invited um, some of our stakeholders in to help us present. I think this time we're going to really try to keep things short just with logistics, how the meeting runs, and our presentation probably just the first 30 minutes at most. Uh, and then really just turn things over to comment where there are easy questions of just clearing something up. We'll have um, specialists in each of these areas as relate to these topics uh, there. So for this first event, we'll have uh, people on Rob's staff, Chris Term, um, but really anybody could come to all of these. I'm very cognizant that maybe these dates don't work equally well for everyone. And we saw in the original listening sessions, everybody, a lot of people came to all of them. I don't know if that's necessary, but certainly anybody is welcome at all of these. So all of this information about everything I've talked about and everything I'm going to talk to you about pretty much today is on uh, Engage CWCB, if not our own CWCB website as well. Um, we do have the plan out and translated in Spanish as well. Um, that was something that was really important and kind of honoring stakeholder feedback that we got. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but our mantra has been, no matter where we go, roundtables, public, is by all means, make a comment. It's hard not to think about the original water plan. It was the first, you got 30,000 comments, but 30,000 actions would be so much more impactful. And that is the kind of change that we need now more than ever. So for sure, if we got something wrong or could say something better, um, yeah, give us that input. We need that. We want to make it better. Um, but take that next step. And if, and if you've already taken that next step and you've done amazing projects, um, tell us that story. And we, we invite each of the directors as well to, to share a story of the kind of project that's showing the way for Colorado that's really in, in, exemplary of that drought resilience that we need to see. So kind of stepping through each of those areas, this is just what it looks like on Engage, you know, you're kind of your forebe into getting into any of these areas, but uh, I'll just step through these a little bit. So on the, you know, make a comment, um, we have a survey option that actually has three tiers. We got some feedback from the first water plan that, um, and maybe even just learning through the BIP update process that some people just want to make general comments. I looked at the survey data last night, probably 80% of what we got is 
general comment. Um, and that, that ranges from any level of helpful to not helpful. I saw one comment that was just blah, blah. I don't know what that means. Um, but uh, I, I take it means it's long, I don't know. Um, but uh, so there's other comments on there that are pro probably more helpful. There's also an opportunity to give specific feedback on chapter by chapter edits. And then we added a third option to allow for a batch update. So for groups like Kava that might want to submit a letter or groups like Audubon that want to, you know, kind of batch upload a, a bunch of survey responses that they've taken, we allow for that option too. And it helps us just to get it through one venue. And I'm sure we're going to get feedback in any number of forms. In fact, I've just gotten a lot of it verbally across the state. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so those are the three options um, for commit to action. We really kind of highlight three areas. Um, you know, one thing I always say, and I think it is this misconception, um, you know, but one of the outreach events I went to, somebody said, well, a, a few people say this, and I kind of a little bit confused by it at times, but I, I think it just shows where we need to educate more. Um, people say, well, ag has all this water, how do we get it? And I think that the issues that they're targeting aren't water quantity issues. They're water quality in cities, they're localized flooding issues. You know, I think about in our backyard here, Elyria, Swansea neighborhood, um, those are the types of issues they're thinking of and they just see volume and they kind of translate it that way. But I think we have a lot of road to go to work with our partner, CDPHE, Power Authority, to really think about SRF programs and how to help address those issues and probably have a lot of way to go to help just get people to the kind of grant programs that are more impactful for what they're trying to do. So we really talk about, you know, in the city, and I always say, you know, Russ Sand sitting in Denver, um, I'm not a water right holder, but I, I have an obligation, I think we all do, to conserve water, to be involved, to be engaged where you can, to know the issues, to know where your water comes from. And increasingly, I think one reporter asked me, what's the biggest misconception? And I think it's just that we're really more connected than we realize. Um, the same things that we've got, you know, some, the same folks that are telling me, how do we get this water from ag are the same people that just got back from their trip to the farmer's market or just got back from their trip to the West Slope. So trying to show those connections to people is, is a big piece of this. And we've really highlighted online just to take that Water 22, uh, you know, commitment, that pledge of the ways that you can conserve, because that's not nothing. And people understanding what their role is and how they're connected is maybe in some cases the most important thing we could do. And if everyone did that and everyone knew that, it's not going to be our silver bullet. We don't have a silver bullet. If we did, we would figure it out. But more people being engaged and understanding how we're connected makes us a stronger state. Um, so we ask people then take that next step to get involved, go to a roundtable meeting, come to a CWCB board meeting, um, and certainly apply for a grant. And again, speaking to good director feedback that we got during the kind of first drafts, I think we really were more explicit than ever of trying to make those ties back to the water plan grant program and how categories fit together and give, uh, I think the way Director Dutton had said it is project level examples of the good work that we know we need to see across the state. In those 50 actions, I will just say they're just 50, they're honestly limitless. There's any number of grants that could come to us and we know that, right? We can't dream them all up, but we tried to hit a broad range of the types of good work that we know we need to see. Oh, and this is just showing you that tie back to the five buckets in the water plan grants. I will highlight here um, in that connection to water plan grants, if you go and look at the criterion guideline, it's clear there's just some outdated language. Um, you know, the board can read through and subsequent meetings and decide if they think there are more substantive changes. But my take would be there's easily just some language cleanup that would probably be a pretty light lift for water plan grants um, and that we should probably target that for January when the plan's finalized. So just um, putting that on your radar because I know I had been the question before. And in the engagement category, there we go. In the engagement category, I would say that big focuses here are the stories I talked about. Um, you know, really was hoping um, that we would get, you know, really foundational, uh, moving stories that are going to help show that way forward. And in the end, I think we've gotten a range of stories just so far that have come in that are uh, just even what people are doing in their local communities. I, I think people being engaged is great either way. Um, but we are getting a lot of feedback and I'll, I'll watch, uh, I'll walk you through a, at least one example of that here in a second. We have a big focus on being more inclusive and, and certainly in our outreach. So let me kind of skip to that. I told you there would be pictures. You may see some of your own images here. Um, there's a picture from CCI, um, Kat Weissmiller and my team has, has certainly been a huge part of this driving it for, oh, by the way, how can I not, I got to just pause and think. Oh, he moved. Matt Lindbergh has been amazing in the entire team and all the LEs that worked through the BIP process, but um, couldn't have had a better partner in this effort than Matt. 
Um, but certainly, um, you know, just highlighting a few, Matt's not in any of these pictures, I should have made him pose for something, but um, Kat is at the Juneteenth Festival. Um, these are some of the images of the events I just told you. There's Sam Stein at the CSU Spur event. That was actually <clears throat> the day before the water plan came out. Um, <clears throat> as we attended, Elizabeth and I attended a Secchia Congresso, actually pre-water plan, kind of like CCI. It was a little bit of a, a, pre, a quick preview and went down and made the trip in a snowstorm, but I was proud to be there and really happy. And, and that's us with Rhonda Lobato, who's just such an amazing person in the state. Uh, and there in the bottom left is a, a Commissioner Mudge who is posing with the water plan too. So lots of fun pictures. And I will just say in terms of stats, um, there are some even better pictures I should have included, but I, I, I didn't. Um, we've had so far to date kind of where we start with a, a Secchia Congresso through to, well, through this week, uh, about 38 outreach events. There's probably actually, you know, maybe 10 more that some of our partners have helped us do. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a ton. <laughs> and then to, that's across 28 counties. And we've already visited and presented to six of nine roundtables and have them all scheduled. Um, and that's just kind of six CWCB staff members. So again, a ton of people working across the state, a ton of staff probably are traveling and I haven't counted that into this, but um, just a huge shout out to all CWCB staff and a huge appreciation to my staff who have, have done a lot of this work of just outreach. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And we're back. <laughs> One second. I want to take a pause and just talk a little bit about um, kind of how we're trying to be more inclusive. And I, these are, this is a lot to read, and, and you certainly don't need to read it all, but I would just highlight, I, I think it's pretty amazing that we worked with our tribal partners on the front end of this through the Southwest BIP to get um, both the Southern Ute and Ute Mountain Ute on board with and helping draft that language that appears and, and really is just copied into the water plan. Um, they were huge partners and so appreciative of, uh, of both tribes also uh, participating on the uh, Water Equity Task Force. We presented to the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs and also did some kind of back end checking back and forth with Catherine Redhorse, who's just amazing and really helpful and just making sure that we got the language right and you know capitalize things appropriately. We presented the Latino Caucus. We concluded our Equity Task Force and we included those principles into the water plan. Um, we also, Elizabeth Skoda on my team is also participating on the Environmental Justice Action Task Force with CDPHE. Um, and a lot of good um, recommendations and work coming out of that. A lot of hard, heartfelt conversations too, but just really appreciate Elizabeth's work on that. And uh, of course, Joel Miner uh, leading that effort on CDPHE and, and all the people that are participating. Um, we've translated the water plan, the fact sheet we put out with the, the survey that I showed you is, is also translated online. And then the four listening sessions, we talked about translation there. And then I just can't understate this, but um, Director Gibbs said, yesterday that um, we now have Ernest House on the IBCC. That is I mean, certainly the first Ute Mountain Ute uh, representative that we've had on IBCC, but I would say probably the first indigenous uh, person that we've had on IBCC. And that's a huge advancement for the state. So all these things are just really, really deeply meaningful to me uh, personally. And I think to a lot of people as we've gone out and talked about it. So here are some of those events I talked about that are just us trying to make an earnest effort to above and beyond all the outreach we're doing, um, really tackle some of these EDI issues. So the Secchia Congresso, Juneteenth Festival, and then this week, we're right in the middle of it, Latino Conservation Week, left right after the board meeting last night and went to an event. And then uh, Elizabeth and I are gonna head out to Glenwood Springs this weekend to go to a Latino Conservation Week event that kind of is the capstone, I think, kind of ending the week. Um, but just, Russ, sorry, I'm going to ask you to stop because 
folks online can't hear. Okay. Thank you. So just to back up, thank you. Um, we are getting a lot of comments online in Spanish, and we have been working with a group called CREA. This is their, their CEO and co-founder or founder, um, Fernando Pineda Reyes, and his whole team has just been really great to work with. I think I have an image of them here, maybe. Six. Just going to be plagued by battery issues, I think, for this. Try again. There we go. So um, this is the maybe a, a larger portion, not the full portion, but a, a larger uh, team at CREA. And they've been really helping us get around. I thought this picture was super cute, so I included it. But um, this, little, this little kid is saying, uh, it, I think the question is, you know, why, why do I love water? And he says that you know, water is life and that he shuts the water off every time he showers, maybe to the chagrin of his mom who wishes it was on longer. But that's just because I have a son. I get it. Um, anyway, I also want to highlight a partnership that we're now leading with a group called Girls Inc. Um, this is a, a, a foundation that's actually just down the street from where I live. And I drive by it um, when I'm when I'm drive, when I drove by it today, and um, I've always thought, wow, how could we get involved? And then somebody had posted online that there were internship opportunities if we wanted to. And so I'm really excited to say that uh, Jacinta Lavado is in the audience right here. She's waving, and if you um, have time to say hi to her, it'd be awesome. But we've got her for about 40 hours, and it's really a part of a multi-year effort um, to kind of help, um, I think, Latinx and then just, you know, um, BIPOC with um, kind of especially females getting into STEM and science and um, environmental issues. And so really, really excited to have her join our team. Um, and we're hopefully going to get her into doing some fun things. I'm, I'm not sure how fun the CWCB board meeting is. No offense, but it's a long day. I, Director Felt said it was painful at the meeting, so I'm leaning on Director Felt. Um, so... <laughs> There we go. Um, I will just talk a little bit about, of course, it's not, you know, I've talked a lot about kind of the EDI, the equity, inclusivity, diversity um, topic, and that's so critical, how we engage with everyone, of course, but we've heard a lot too, and I think one of our founding principles in that the guiding principles document for equity is about how we bridge that rural or urban divide, and we've heard um, Director Sakata talk really eloquently, I think, about uh, a lot of time ag isn't getting paid to be at the table. They may be losing money to come to an event. So it's also incumbent upon us to reach out to the agricultural community. Um, we've done uh, multiple ag board meetings to date. I think we've got about 30 groups that we're reaching out to. And that's because from, from the get-go is really cognizant, especially after just, and I know Kern is probably listening online, but she, uh, Director Trick would be the first to tell you that um, you know, nobody in North Park is going to come to a meeting in the summer. And so it, we have to go to them. We have to make the overtures. And we talked with Kawa on the front end of this and got some good advice from Greg Peterson to say, go to every board meeting, go to every group that you can um, and get their input. And um, we are trying to do that. And I will give a huge kudos to Nora on my team, who I think I have a picture of her here um, because she said, you may not all know her, that's fair. So this is Nora, it's not in her office, although this could be the 1313 basement. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Nora uh, when she went up to the Upper Yampa Water Conservancy District uh, at Stagecoach. And um, anyway, I wanted you to see her and know that she's really one of the ones going around the state right now, her and uh, Kara Sobieski making the kind of ag road, uh, road show. So um, huge kudos to, to Nora who is on the road now and couldn't listen in, but um, it's because she's reaching out to people. Um, but we've had critical partnerships. Uh, CDA, you heard it from Commissioner Greenberg. I'm just amazing partners. I think we're very much aligned on the same page and kind of see each other as auxiliary staff that we have the same goal and how can we augment what each other's doing. Got a ton of ag uh, outreach on the front end. I think some of the stuff of late, I will just call out and maybe I've already touched on, but when you hear the 90, you know, whatever you, 85% diversion, 91% use numbers, it's hard not to, I think for some people on the front end, just to instantly see that as, well, that's wasteful, right? And that's just a hard discussion to put on a fact sheet, right? But we can probably do a better job of calling that out somehow and talking how maybe 60% of that is coming back to streams in, in some form because of conveyance losses or uh, return flows. And so we need to better tell that story. I think we've got some input along those lines and I think that we can do that. I think we do that in the water plan a little bit harder on just a, a quippy fact sheet, but um, I think we can get there. We've got some good input. Um, I know, uh, you know, two or three people have said this to me. It's a, a lot of people like the term. I think a, a preponderance of people like the term 
uh, collaborative water sharing agreements, but we've gotten some folks that have just, you know, does that sound more like we're sharing and it's not being paid for? So just making sure that we're talking about it being compensated, voluntary, um, within prior appropriation, uh, supporting um, prior appropriation system is critical. And so we will continue to discuss that. Um, we've gotten a lot of good input. I, you know, I was really touched just to see uh, Carlisle Courier say that in one of the kind of, uh, I don't know if that was from KUNC or something, but he said, I think they did their best to represent ag. And I think that's what we're really trying to do by every group in the, in the state is just do our best by them. Um, so definitely happy to get more input from the ag community and we're certainly getting it on the road, but I, I will say across the board, fairly positive feedback. And I, you know, that's great, and I, I hope it continues. But if we get tough comments, I'm sure it will make us better, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to hear all those out. Um, on the environment and rec front, I think we got some specific feedback, maybe that um, you know we hadn't done enough to kind of talk about recreation. We could probably call that out better. I would agree there. I think we just generally get heads down and think about low flows is terrible for everything, and maybe uh, need to more specifically call out rec. Um, I will say environment and rec ha have probably on the front end of this process had the most insight and consistent input. We got 12 page document, I think on the front end of this about all the things they were hoping to see in the water plan. They're very organized. We have a lot of insight there and a lot of good partners, um, just like with ag and, and having Greg, Greg Peterson kind of help give us guidance at time. I mean, Abby Burke has been so foundational, Jared Romero with TRCP, um, just a lot of good partners helping guide us on, you know, make sure we include these things, think about this. And um, I think we've gotten, again, some really nice feedback from the ENR community on the back end of this too, of just that we, again, maybe had, had listened to them and done right by them. Uh, on the municipal side, uh, Director Feld stole my thunder a little bit, but I, I also wanted to thank you for organizing the CCI event and then also um, going you know, out of your way, I think even from vacation to forward on communications we wanted when the water plan came out to get that out to all the county commissioners. And CCI, I think is 61 of 64 counties. So we're hitting a, a ton of people. Um, I think oddly it's, uh, and Director Felt, you can correct me. I think it's Denver and uh, Boulder and one other. I don't remember that's not included, but we're getting most of the counties there. So we've, we um, have a lot of partnership on the front end too, working with C uh, Colorado Springs Utilities, Denver Water and others across the state. I think on the, the very front end of some of the scoping, Kevin Reedy was really instrumental in kind of reaching out to a lot of folks in, uh, you know, in the municipal industrial side, but also in the ENR side and talking about what are those issues, a lot of stuff around transformative land Landscape change, and I think we've got some good work there. Uh, also, we'll shout out to, um, I was very touched because I know um, Alden Vandenbrink is, is a, you know, he's, he's a muni guy and he's not afraid to let you know what he thinks. And at the, <laughs> I thought I was going to get it good at the YAMP, and I'm sure he, he said he was going to have some written comments, but he also went out of his way to say that we had listened and listened to the round tables and that he saw that in the water plan. And I really, I really appreciate that. And that meant a lot to me because I think we, we, we did try to do that for all the input we got. So all this rolls into the four areas that you all know well. I, I guess just a point I've tried to make, and some based on board feedback and some you know, public comment too, is you know, these four areas are just a neat way to organize the plan. Before we had what I like to call the wheel of fortune, got really messy. There was a lot of things not included in the wheel that we probably needed to add. And so this, there were gonna be a lot more spokes if we went that way. These are just functionally a way to organize the plan, but it is impossible to see these as not intertwined and interconnected. Uh, if we're talking about, you know, agriculture, we're talking about selling to cities, we're talking about, you know, people that need jobs coming to work on farms, we're talking about the streams that run through it. All these areas are intertwined, and we certainly don't want to lose that. So I've, I've harped on that message as we go out and about to talk about this, because, again, people seeing how we're connected to each other is so critical to our success. Um, I also like to remind people and, and, and uh, here today too that it's, it's not, this isn't you know, new. As, as much as it is a new plan, we also built on the foundation of the original plan and the water plan grants. I think all the things, you know, whether they were explicit actions, unless we'd completed it fully or um, you know, it didn't make sense anymore, we included all the you know, quote unquote actions before into this plan and they're all you know, traced back in here. We did a little bit of crosswalk to make sure that all those what I would call statements appear in this plan. So there is foundationally this kind of lineage or history of all the input we've gotten. So I would say the original 30,000 comments, 
comments that we got along the way from you know our technical advisory teams through the technical update process that feeding into the BIP updates and then all rolling into the water plan. And then of course, also rolling into other tools that we're developing and it's, it's not ready today, but by the next time I come to you, hopefully by water Congress, we'll actually be able to show, but we're also trying to do things outside of just making the plan shorter and easy to read to make it more accessible to anyone. So where we have a water plan data visualization tool that we'll be launching soon, I'm really proud to say that will also be available in Spanish. So that's a, a huge step forward. I'm not sure that anybody is doing, but this is really to unpack the technical data, the technical update behind the plan and make it a little bit more fun, interactive way. If you don't know what a scenario is, it'll help walk you through that. If you wanna see on a high level, how scenarios and the, the drivers in them may interact, you can do that. If you wanna bring up a map and say, what's happening in my area or click on and off things around ag, muni environment, you can do that. Um, we also have you know, been hard at work and I would huge appreciation to Anna Moss on our team, but um, you know everything that we're doing to kind of modernize our processes with the grant loan portal, um, you know, Kevin Reedy, Sam Stein were instrumental in updating House Bill 1051 database, so our municipal and conservation reporting tool, and then um, it's just the project database. So that should be out uh, really any day now. We're just waiting for IT to kind of give the final stamp of approval and publish it. Um, but that we, we took again roundtable feedback on some you know minor tweaks they wanted to have and really in all these even when you think about WSRF grants there's workflows that are built in for the roundtables to make it easier on them I think a big thing we're often reminded of of no matter where you're coming from the roundtable work is volunteer work so ways that we can make it easier so if an applicant wants to apply for WSRF they can use this portal it wraps it up nicely for the roundtable the roundtable can approve if uh, somebody wants to put something in the project database uh, the roundtable has the ability to do that or if they want to pull data out to talk about project proponents um, there will be some power users at the roundtable level that can do that so with that i will just say and i think um you know we've we've done a lot of outreach we've got 75 or i just looked at the survey responses um just kind of last night and again today about 75 responses again the you know majority of those are just general comments um you know, 750 people at events so far, just rough numbers, probably 180 roundtable members, and then thousands of folks online, radio, and maybe even now TV. This CREA group has been so great to work with. They're actually going to have me on a radio spot that reaches out to 10,000 members of the Latinx community this Friday, and then they're doing some TV work too. So um, we're really kind of making, I think, a stronger effort than ever, not to just be out and about in the traditional sense, but you know, in every way we can imagine and, and really engage our partners in helping us get the word out there. And they're certainly doing that. Um, so still much to go and we'll kind of round up everything in September uh, when, the, when the process ends and have probably uh, final tallies and kind of you know, roll up some of that feedback to you in the November board meeting. So I think this is my last slide here. I would just say, um, you know, this, this is the theme I've tried to kind of reiterate when we go out and about that we can't do this together. I think one of the reporters asked me, I was like, well, um, <laughs> your, the water plan's kind of painting a little bit of a dire picture here with drought and climate, and but you're saying you can do all these things. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, that's right. It's tough. Like, I, we, can't, we can't whitewash that. It's, it's tough. Everybody here is feeling it. Uh, I think we got a lot of director feedback to be explicit about that. I don't think we could deliver an honest water plan any other way. But I would also just you know, use the, the Brad Udall quote that you can't depress people into action. And there, there is absolutely a thread of to Director Bruchet's theme of hope that we can do this together. We may not be able to stop mega fires or these big droughts, but we can absolutely work together to mitigate the worst of these impacts. And we have it in us to do it. We need help. So you know, the 50 actions or limitless actions that anybody can come to us with are gonna help get us there. And hopefully our job and with our collaborative agencies uh, is to help provide better tools and resources uh, or you know, convening groups that help move those conversations forward to help further those efforts. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Russ. That was a great presentation. I do take a little bit of insult to the, our board meetings being boring. <laughs> I mean, there's laughing and crying and <laughs> I can't imagine candy. Um, so, you know, I think you're just not seeing the fun that we're having up here somehow. It's I haven't not had my candy clear. yet. Boring's not bad. <laughs> yeah. There you go. But thank you. Um, any questions for Russ before we move on to public comment? Yes, Director Sakata. Thanks so much, Russ, and thanks for all the outreach you're doing. It's been fantastic. It's amazing what you're accomplishing. And I know sometimes in that outreach, 
part, I, um, I know you, sometimes you have to be careful to not venture into the politics of things sometimes. And so I know that's a fine line, but have you reached out directly to, you know, state elected officials or federal elected officials? A uh, great question. And, and maybe while I have the mic to Director Sakata to touch on something else you said, we have had, um, just to, to the audio issues, we have had um, a, a little bit of a hard time just with what procurement allows us to purchase for roundtables, but that limit has just been increased. So my intent is if the owls work the best, and or at least are within the price bracket that we can pay for to kind of purchase those for all roundtables so that we can give those out. Um, to your question, we have not um, really reached out on the federal level, but we absolutely have worked through Alice Cosgrove and the Ledge office to um, it, the day it launched, we passed everything along. Actually, I think maybe the, the morning of or the night before, pushed everything through to the legislature um, and have invited them if they have events that they want us to be at or if they want to participate in our events to come. Um, uh, what I have just learned, I think, is that Water Congress, there'll be an interim water resource review committee meeting that I think we're top of the, that's for those who want to wake up early, we'll be first up, I think, presenting there. So um, yes, absolutely been in, involved with those groups and, and have done more than a few kind of town hall events with um, representatives and legislators, uh, legislators who have asked us to. Director Felt. Russ, you, you got 70 days to go or something like that. Um, is there any specific ask of the board in terms of this comment period, or is this this is more of a time for us to work, work on other stuff and then get ready to to be uh, trying to incorporate everything you heard and you know to help you in the, the reconciliation period? No, great great question. Um, I, I think sometime we need to revisit the discussion around a board letter at the front of this and start thinking about how we do that and what that looks like. I, I would definitely love, you know, I think, you know, of the more helpful comments in the general comment that somebody caught a typo, that's that's fair, that kind of input even, or if there's something big that we missed that you want clarified uh, in the plan as you reread would be helpful. Um, I, I always think, you know, you, uh, we're trying to get out in community um, and when we have the new four regional coordinators, we'll be even more so, but right now you're often the years on the ground. So if you're hearing things, <clears throat> please roll that up to us and, I, you know, it's just really helpful to be out and about and talk with Joe Frank and Jim Yon about their feelings around, and I know Terry Skanga had the same feeling of, is collaborative water sharing the right term? And just to be able to follow up with them, I would rather, you know, we're gonna get a lot of general comments. We've kind of set the stage that we will aggregate those because I do think it's helpful for maybe how you're writing your letter or as a commissioner, um, the kind of things that your constituents are saying. Um, but when we get those really specific comments, rather than just kind of respond online where we can follow up one-on-one -on -one or, or have some kind of conversation before. I'd like to have that thoughtful conversation. So anything you're hearing, just pass along to us. And I think it, it was your comment earlier. We can just kind of stop the spinning. If there's a concern, I'd, I'd love to just get in front of that and bring people together and meet. And we'll, we'll make time to do it. Thank you. Any other comments for Russ? Uh, Matt, do you want to come up and we'll get your picture? <laughs> Since we don't have any pictures of you, yeah. you guys all know how terrible I am at taking photographs. Yeah. So it's gonna be a good She's one. Yeah. She makes sure to present the worst ones of you. I just want you to know. Yeah. We saw the river photos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Maybe with us in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we're in the public comment portion of our meeting today, and we have a few folks signed up. So we'll start uh, with Bart Miller. He is here to comment on agenda item eight, which was, wait for it, the Colorado River updates. Welcome, Bart. 
Thanks very much, uh, directors uh, Bart Miller with Western Resource Advocates. And um, I wish I were there with you today. It sounds like you're having fun. Um, and uh, this is not about the water plan, um, but it is about agenda item eight. Um, I just wanted to uh, spend two or three minutes uh, acknowledging that as we experience another really hot and dry summer, that rivers are feeling the heat. Um, we've heard about the dangerous low flow conditions in the upper Colorado and uh, it's hitting a lot of places. So it's an, yet another reminder that rivers and river health are a key part of how we meet our water challenges in Colorado. And yeah, ref referring to agenda item eight, which I think you covered yesterday afternoon early, um, <clears throat> things are getting tight on the Colorado River and uh, Colorado and other basin states that share the Colorado uh, and partners at the Bureau of Reclamation and other federal agencies have taken new and fairly unprecedented steps, um, declaring an official shortage in the lower basin, uh, implementing a drought operations plan in the upper basin. Um, but even in the midst of that pretty dramatic new stuff, um, we've been seizing opportunities to cooperate and meet multiple needs. And I'm thinking specifically about the drought operations plan of this year, releasing half a million acre feet from Flaming Gorge down to Lake Powell to protect levels in that lake, but also being timed in a way that uh, could benefit hydropower, endangered fish, stream temperatures, and local recreation. So it's just, a, it's an example, and I guess as Colorado joins with other upper basin states in responding to the commissioner reclamation's call to action about you know, all sectors and all states um, finding ways to save water, I guess I hope we can seize additional opportunities like that to meet a range of needs. And so really briefly, as I think the two-point plan that you heard, or the five-point plan you heard about yesterday has two points in it that are, I think, right on target here, like the drought operations and the uh, revitalization of the system conservation pilot program. Um, for those two in particular, I think, uh, I hope we can highlight the importance of the environmental and recreational values uh, being on par with other uses that are at risk uh, under the hydrologic conditions that we're facing, and that those values, environmental and recreational ones, are not merely a luxury that we can sacrifice during a crisis, but they really are foundational elements in for Colorado communities, local economies, and our way of life generally. And in, in light of that, I hope that environmental and recreational considerations can be incorporated into any kind of flexible programs that are used to address drought and infrastructure um, and, and be service criteria or part of the list of criteria for programs like that. And, and finally, I guess this, uh, if there is an, indeed a new system conservation program or other water conservation program, I hope that as decision makers for the state, that you can help seize opportunities to optimize some of those benefits that spread across uh, the state and across uses and finding ways to address some of those, those tricky remaining questions about the scope of those programs, how they can shepherd water downstream at times of the year that benefit a range of, of uses and purposes like uh, recreational and environmental purposes and the monitoring and measuring uh, of the conservation efforts. So those all feel to me like part of a no regrets strategy as we face a pretty uncertain future. Uh, so for all the work ahead, I know um, just following the heels of rust here, there's an opportunity to improve water security along with vibrant communities, uh, robust agriculture and environmental values. So our situation is a challenging one. I think we all know that, but I think we can meet this challenge. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bart, um, and thanks for your comments on the Colorado River uh, and also for vocalizing how much fun we have here at the board. <laughs> the words getting out. Yeah, I sorry, just wanted to let you know that we hear your comments on the Colorado River and really appreciate that you took the time um, to come to public comment and share them with us. We, so, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but I think it's really important, even though we all hear in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, how people feel about the Colorado River, but that this is um, a place and a forum that people feel that they can come and share with us how this impacts their work and their lives. And I hope more people do that. So thanks for taking the time. Go ahead, Com uh, Commissioner, Director Mitchell. <laughs> 
Bart, I just want to thank you for your comments. Um, and I wanted to use this opportunity. I think you you mentioned a couple of things in, in the five point plan. And I just wanted to, uh, to share some hot off the presses news that um, uh, that the Hickenlooper Barrasso bill to help avoid mandatory cuts to Colorado River usage passed um, ENR committee about uh, maybe 45 minutes ago, maybe an hour ago. Um, and that is that system conservation pilot program. Um, uh, continuation language that we expected. So um, I just wanted to, to kind of use your public comment period um, to share that news. And I had just emailed it to you all. So okay. thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. All right, we'll move forward into our next public comment, Deb Daniel. Um, she's not online. Okay. Got it. Um, Andrew Allison Godfrey on agenda item 19, the water plan update. You have, nope. Okay. How about Don Baumgart? Okay, Don, welcome. He's also here for the um, water plan update agenda item. You have Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, okay. There we go. Okay. Um, my, my name is Don Baumgart, and I'm a concerned citizen who lives in Denver. I'm very interested in the water plan. Uh, I'm very issue. I'm very interested in water issues here in Colorado, and I have a few comments about the plan that I'd like to make. Um, first, I'd like to thank the staff of CWCB for their hard work to protect water, uh, Colorado's water future, and their efforts to update the water plan. And I'd like to thank the members of the board for volunteering this effort as well. I've served on public service boards before, and I understand that it's difficult work with an occasional thank you for compensation. So here's one more thank you. Um, I have a few unrelated comments to make that uh, regarding the plan. First, the word conservation is in the name of this board, and I believe that cons conserving, as in using a resource as wisely as possibly, should be the primary emphasis of the water plan. As, a, as we all know, climate change may well decrease the amount of water we have available in the future. All Colorado residents, businesses, and agriculture interests need to be encouraged and incentivized to find ways to use water wisely and use less of it. The revised plan states that conservation efforts led to a 5% reduction per capita in per capita water use between 2008 and 2015. There's so much more that we can do to further reduce per capita consumption uh, instead of trying to miraculously find more water from sources that don't have a lot more water flowing down them. Um, yesterday, I listened to the director's report portion of, of this meeting, which by the way, I did not find boring and heard mention of the city of Aurora's efforts to lead the way to plant less turf grass. This board and the new plan should find ways to encourage all municipal users to implement significant conservation plans. Uh, second, the 2015 water plan identified 400,000 400, acre foot gap in our future needs based on population estimates from the state demographer's office. Since 2015, that 400,000 acre feet and more of new supply have been identified and some of those projects have been completed. Now the state demographer has lowered population growth numbers, but the draft plan is calling for even more usage. Why? If the population isn't growing as quickly and per capita usage is trending downward, why do we need to find even more water to store than is identified in the first plan? And, and third, I have a more specific question about some numbers and graphs in the plan. On page 3-17, there's a graph that shows municipal water use, I believe, I believe it's usage now, at, at 380,000 acre feet. On page 3-20, just three pages later, there's a bar graph that shows projected municipal water use ranging from 900,000 acre feet to 1,700,000 acre feet in 2015, under 20, in 2050 under uh, different scenarios. That's roughly two to four times more water than we're using that, than we're using according to the graph just three pages earlier. My understanding is that this projected use in 2050 is supposed to be tied to population and industrial growth. So is the projected municipal need by 2050 many times higher than now, or is the section just worded in a way that's too difficult for this layperson to understand? Um, finally, I have a comment on the meaning of the word goals. I was taught that goals need to be measurable, attainable, and have a definite time horizon. The things labeled goals um, related to each basin in chapter four, the chapter titled Basin Context, have none of these attributes. 
It's understood that this board has limited authority to make all the things discussed in this plan actually happen by themselves, but it's not productive to have so many vague aspirations masquerading as goals in such an important plan. The plan would be much more useful with fewer, more measurable actual goals. Again, thank you to the board and staff of CWCB uh, for giving me this time uh, to make a few comments. Thank you, sir, for joining us and thanks for your comments. Um, I hope that we have your contact information as part of this and can follow up with you. I heard a specific question in there that I don't know that we can answer uh, right away, but definitely get you in contact with, with Russ. Um, and thank you. Yes, um, I know Viola has my email contact. Great. Thank you. Thanks again for that. Uh, Director Dutton. Hey, Don, I just want to thank you for taking the time, uh, especially in the middle of the day for to join our meeting and just it sounds like you've you've had a pretty thorough reading of the plan already. So thank you for taking the time and thank you for your really specific and um, well thought out questions and comments. They're they're really helpful. So thank you. Don, if you're still there, just was curious, um, are there any parts of the plan that that you that really stuck out since you obviously read 2015 in this plan that you um, that you have kudos for us on or I mean I don't want to <laughs> I just it's always nice to hear what things stand out to the public too I'm not looking for a pat on the back no, um, no I, I appreciate that and, and I, you know, when, when you only have a couple minutes you 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 have to make you sure you get your points that you don't understand or don't necessarily you know that you think can be better but yeah I mean I, I think that the, the early part of the, the, the plan that describes um, where Colorado's water is and how it's used, I, I think should be required for everyone in the state if we could get if we could figure out how to get people to, to read it. Um, because I mean, to me, it's fascinating how, how all of this works. Um, and I, I just think most people don't really understand. And um, if, if we could get that and if we can if we can figure out how to inform more people about um, how it all works, I think we'd all be better off. Thanks. That's great feedback. And sorry to put you on the spot, but it's always just great to talk to somebody that isn't in the water industry and hear their thoughts on that. I, I think Director Mitchell has a question for you too, if you have another minute. Sure. And and Don, one of uh, this is Director Mitchell. Uh, it, one of the things that that we're really pushing forward is uh, getting the water message out. And, and we all have certain jobs and, and things we have to do. And there's other organizations that, that do things like that. But I'm wondering how you got involved because I think we need to be doing more of that. I don't think your questions are lay person questions um, at all. And I, I was taking notes on something you said about goals, measurable, have a time horizon and I missed the middle one. Um, uh, attainable. Attainable. Um, and so some of them are not attainable, I think sometimes um, in, with my personal goals, but, um, but um, I'm just kind of wondering how you heard about it, how you got involved because we, we want to reach as many people, but you know the importance of water. Um, we all know the importance of water and spreading that message is important. Well, I'm actually relatively new um, resident of Colorado. I've been here about two years and moved to catch up with some family that already made the good decision to move to Colorado, um, but moved from an even drier climate than this. And so I've, I've, I guess I've sort of just paid attention to water for a long time because I think in the, in the Western US, it, you, you need to. Um, and so, I mean, I guess I don't know where I'm going with that. So um, I'm, I've just been paying attention to a lot and, and I'm interested in reading about water. I am actually, um, uh, I, I live in the West Denver metro area. And um, I think the first, the first things I learned about the water plan and specific things were, is the issue with uh, Bear Creek Lake uh, and possibly expanding that reservoir. So um, that, just led me to want to learn more in a lot of different ways about water and about what was going on with the plan. I appreciate your comments so much, Don. And um, I, I've been, we'll keep your contact info because we need to stay in contact with folks like you. So um, we expect to see you again. 
Well, I'm, I'm retired and looking for things to do and, and water is where I would love to spend my time. <laughs> well, you live, you live in a nice area of Denver. Thanks. <laughs> we'll, we'll forward you um, Director Sakata's list of meetings. <laughs> and we hope to see you at any and all of them. And, and other... I heard, yeah, I heard none, none of his meetings are boring. <laughs> no, we do not look at all the fun we're having. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Again, Ross. All right, any other questions for Don before we let him off the hook here? One more, uh, Director Hawkins, you have the floor. Um, it's a comment and it's really to provide cover for our staff and our consultants. Um, I think that there's always some tension between making like really smart, you know, these measurable, um, outcomes or goals and setting ambitious vision. And so just saying that I hear your comment and I think that's something that we can work for. But when we're setting, you know, this big of a vision for a state that sometimes we have to sort of take a step back from things being measurable so we can adequately capture, you know, the, the full range of what the plan is gonna cover. So I wanted to let you know that this is something that I certainly have been thinking about in, in helping to inform the plan, but there are trade-offs between being really specific and being really ambitious in vision. And I think we're walking that line. That's Got good. it. Thank you. All right, well, thanks again for joining us and we look forward to maybe meeting you in person sometime. So take care and thanks again. Uh, looks like Alec Fleischer, also on Water Plan. Welcome, Alec. You have the floor. Hi. Um, thanks for ha having me. My name is Alec. Um, can you hear me? We can. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, I live in Durango, Colorado, but I've I've lived all across the state in the Arkansas Valley, in the San Luis Valley, and I know how water or lack thereof really affects the state. Um, first, I just want to say what I really like about the plan, which is your grants, and I'd always support more funding for any sort of conservation program. So any tangible, we're going to approve this project, or we're going to fund this project in order to save this many thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of water is something I'm in favor of. Um, but a lot of the plan really just felt like fluff to me. And we're in a climate emergency right now. It seems like every other year, the state's on fire. Um, less water is accessible. We're pulling water out of aquifers at an unsustainable rate. I also like to boat, so I live in Durango, so I'm mostly on the Animus now. And it's clear just water levels are not what they used to be, especially when you talk to people a little older than me. I'm 25. Um, so I, I'm just hesitant towards spending so much time always developing plans and then developing another plan. I think the time for action is now. We need to be funding infinitely more programs to uh, reduce our water usage. And also we need to be blunt about the real users of our water. 91% of it is ag. How much of that land for ag is actually just for luxury ranches or for cattle that are extremely inefficient? We should acknowledge that it is possible to grow much more food on a fraction of the land using a fraction of the water if we change our methods and potentially change our diets. So these are the real questions we need to ask if we want to dramatically reduce our water usage. So that, that's my message. I just want to spread urgency. This is you know, the defining issue of our time, and I don't think anyone is doing enough to act on it. So I encourage you to, to do more things like your grants, where it's like clear, this is how we're saving water. This is how we're being more resilient to climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. And I, I think you'll hear um, from the rest of the board, but I just wanted to say thank you for um, the note about funding. We continue to work really hard to see where we can expand our funding sources. And you may remember the, um, <clears throat> the gambling uh, bill that was passed a few years ago, and, and we're going to see the fruits of that labor. And, and I know our staff and Coloradans in general uh, seem to support water project funding. So we're going to continue to do our best in that realm so we can make more funds available. And then I think we'll have folks address your specific questions. I We'll start with Director Hawkins. 
Thanks, Alex, for taking the time to join us today. I just wanted to let you know that I am the board member from the Southwest Basin. I'm also from Durango, so would love to follow up with you after this meeting and, um, and meet you. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that during my Basin Director's Report this morning, I also shared um, my feelings of urgency to really start implementing things that are going to make our communities more resilient now. So just in case you didn't hear that this morning, that was a message that came from me. And I just have to say I'm really proud to see someone that I maybe I'm old, but I consider you a young person who's really engaged in water in our basin, and that just warms my heart. So thank you again for your time today. Yeah, thank you for, for working on this. And, and I, I agree. Um, just in the end, in 20 years from now, when, you, when you're talking to your kids, are they going to say, wow, you made a great water plan that was you know, 300, 400 pages? Or are they going to say, wow, mom, look, you, you helped fund that. And that's what I encourage you to do and make the large number of changes we need. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Alec? Uh, Director Sakata, was that a, yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Alec. Um, thanks very much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. As a farmer, I have a question for you. We're, a lot of us are really struggling financially and we really want to get more support from local, you know, so people will support buying local fruits and vegetables. Do you have suggestions of how we can really move that, that concept forward? Well, th that's another big topic, of course. Um, well, I think in, in relation to water, I would like to see us moving towards more appropriate crops and more appropriate um, agricultural methods. You know, we're very accustomed to beef and dairy and cow products in this country, and some of that level is good, but maybe just advertising, if you're a farmer growing diverse products, hey, this product is going to use a lot less water, and it's just makes more sense for the climate. Um, maybe that's one idea, but I, I don't have the solutions for you right now. Sorry. Well, I, I hope you consider that and think about that. Some farmers are even looking at uh, different programs that they can market their st items as sustainable or regenerative. And so it seems like consumers are responding to some of those things, but I think it is really so important. I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit that we really look to local consumers to look for local products. And, you know, it's so easy to go to the big box stores where you don't know where your fruits and vegetables are coming from. So I hope uh, everybody listening online will know that we're fr fresh fruit and vegetables in Colorado are now in season. So look for them uh, wherever you can and support, support us. Thanks for that. Director Sakata. and thanks again. Are there any other questions for Alec before we let him go? Okay, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, friends, we've, we've, um, unless there is anybody in the room, okay, we've uh, come to the end of our meeting, and we're a little bit early. So um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. Thank you, Director <laughs> Anderson. And I'll need a second. All right, Director Felt, thank you. Any discussion on adjourning our meeting? Seeing none. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. And the motion carries. This meeting is adjourned.